Chapter 41 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 41 American Independence. England had won Canada from the French, but she was soon to lose her own great colonies to the south of Canada. Ever since she had had colonies at all, England had said that all their trade should be hers. They were not allowed to trade with any other country but the mother country. The colonies had never complained, but there had been a great deal of smuggling and trade with other countries of which England had taken no notice. Now England, after all her fighting and her many victories, was in need of money, and Grenville, the chief man in the English Parliament at the time, passed his famous Stamp Act. This Act said that for all documents written or printed in the American colonies, and for all newspapers, paper should be used which had been first stamped by the English government. The people who bought the paper had to pay for the stamp. This was a new way of taxing the colonies, and they were very angry. They said that they would not use the paper, and in the next year it was given up. But the English Parliament passed a law saying that England had the right to make any laws she pleased for her colonies. This made the colonies still more angry. William Pitt, who had now been made Earl of Chatham, said that England had not any right to tax the colonies without their consent. Although Pitt had done so much to win India and Canada for England, he felt that the mother country ought to leave her colonies free. He told Parliament that he rejoiced that America had resisted. It was not long before new duties or taxes were put upon certain things going to the colonies from England. The colonists must pay the tax and the English have the money. The people of America had offered to give money to the English government to help it, but they were very angry at this new attempt to tax them. The colonists began to hate every Englishman they saw, and when a quarrel broke out in Boston between some of the people in the street and some English soldiers, in which three of the Americans were killed, the colonists called it the Boston Massacre. At last all the new taxes were taken off, except one on tea. The East India Company brought a great deal of tea from India, and generally they had to pay a tax when it came into England. But the company was very poor at this time, and so the government let it off from paying the tax. This made the company able to sell the tea much cheaper, and now a great quantity of tea was sent over the sea in ships to America. But the colonists were told, that they must pay just this one tax of threepence on every pound of tea they bought. Even then they would have got the tea at a very low price, but they were very indignant. They thought that the English were playing a trick, and trying to tempt them to buy the cheap tea and pay a tax at the same time. So no one would buy the tea, and ship after ship sailed back to England without unloading. One ship lay at anchor in Boston Harbor. It had been there nineteen days, and yet looked as though it meant to stay there. There was a law that any ship must unload its cargo before twenty days had passed from its arrival. So the men of Boston made up their minds to attack this ship which had broken the law. Some of them painted their faces and stuck feathers in their heads, and pretended to be Indians. They rushed on to the ship, waving pistols and tomahawks. While the English captain and sailors were staring in surprise, they cut open the boxes in which the tea was and emptied it into the sea. They emptied more than three hundred boxes altogether. Next morning tea lay drifting along all the shore of Massachusetts. It was now England's turn to be angry. Everyone felt that the men of Boston had begun a real revolution. No one would tell who the men were, who had disguised themselves as Indians and done this thing. And so an order came from England that Boston was to be punished. No ship was to go in or out of its harbor, 
and its trade was to be taken to the town of Salem. For the future, any one giving trouble by attacking the English was to be brought over to England to be tried before English judges and juries. Everyone felt that this was unjust, but by this time the colonists had made up their minds to fight for their liberties. Men from all the colonies met at Philadelphia, and it was agreed that they should join together and resist the English. There was a struggle at a place called Lexington, which made the two sides bitterer than ever against each other. Some English soldiers had been sent from Boston to destroy some gunpowder and other things which the American side had collected at Concord, eighteen miles away. They had to pass by Lexington, and there they found sixty or seventy men ready to try to stop them. The English fired twice on these men, and then the Americans went away. But eight of them had been killed. The English did their work at Concord, and then set out again for Boston. On their way back, Americans were continually shooting at them from behind buildings and trees and rocks to take revenge for the Americans they had killed on their way to Concord. Many English were killed, until at Lexington one thousand men from Boston came to their help. There was a fight, in which more than seventy English and about fifty Americans were killed. The English really won, and most of them got safely back to Boston, but they had lost more men than the Americans, who grew more hopeful when they saw that their volunteers, who were not used to war, could fight quite well against the English soldiers. THE BATTLE OF BUNKER'S HILL The first real fight was called the Battle of Bunker's Hill. A few hundred volunteers, men with ordinary clothes and any guns they could get, were placed on the hills outside Boston to defend that city. Although the battle is called after Bunker's Hill, it was really fought on Breed's Hill. About four thousand soldiers attacked them. Three times the volunteers drove them down the hill, but at last the soldiers won their way up, and more than one hundred of the volunteers lay dead. Then another Congress met at Philadelphia, and named Colonel George Washington General of the American Army and so the man who had fought so well for England at Fort Duquesne was now to fight against her. He soon won Boston back and drove the English soldiers to Halifax. On the 4th of July, 1776, the Congress drew up the famous Declaration of Independence of the United States of America, by which an end was put to any connection of the colonies with the mother country. But there was still fighting to be done, and Washington had a very hard task before him. His soldiers were badly clothed and fed. Neither side had very big armies, but the English had the soldiers who knew already something about fighting. Then some of the colonists, who were called the Loyalists, were against the Declaration, and did not want to break away from England. These were a hindrance. There were many others who hated fighting, and most of the volunteers only joined the army for a certain fixed time, and would then go home, often just when they might have been useful. But the English on their side did very foolish things. They seemed to think that it would be an easy thing to conquer the Americans, or to believe that they were not really in earnest. Pitt, who had known so well how to choose the best men as officers, was no longer in power, and most of the officers on the English side were very poor commanders. Sir William Howe, the brother of Lord Howe, who had been sent by Wolfe to fight in Canada and had died there, and of Admiral Lord Howe, was a very different man from his brothers. He made up his mind to take Philadelphia, and took it, but his armies were all far apart instead of keeping close and helping each other. One of them, under General Burgoyne, surrendered to the Americans at Saratoga in 1777. Next year, the French, who were still full of anger at the great victories England had won over them in India and Canada, agreed to the independence of the American colonies, and France and England were once more at war. Pitt, now old and ill, begged Parliament to try to win the good will of the Americans again. "'You cannot conquer America,' he told Parliament, 
and beg them to show a spirit of friendship and mercy to the colonists but the king george the third did not like pitt and would not give him any power in the country george the third who had boasted that he was born and bred a briton and was not at all german like his father and grandfather could not bear the idea of giving in george had a great deal of power over parliament and chose men who governed the country it was greatly his fault that england had been so foolish in her treatment of america pitt made one last great speech in the house of lords in the april of seventeen seventy eight he fell back in a fit when his speech was over for the excitement had been too much for him and he died a few weeks after after this there was never any chance of america being won back england had to fight hard against france and spain at sea the french ships helped the americans to take yorktown in virginia where lord cornwallis and a large army had to give in to them lord cornwallis was the cleverest of the english officers who fought in the war this was really the end of the war though new york which had refused to join in the declaration of independence was still held by the english peace was made in seventeen eighty three with both france and america admiral rodney had shown by his victories over the french and spanish fleets that england was still the greatest sea power but she now openly agreed to american independence and all the thirteen colonies were now joined as a federal republic that is each state governed itself in its own affairs and sent representatives to the congress which settled the affairs in which they all had a part the new republic was called and is still the united states of america its capital was new york its first president was the hero george washington old and gray before his time through his labors and suffering for his country so england lost her first great group of colonies a clever frenchman once said that a colony will always break away from the mother country when it is old enough and strong enough to look after itself but we have no proof of this indeed england has many colonies today which are proud of belonging to her but she has learned her lesson and gives them every liberty she can meanwhile the united states which at first were the thirteen colonies on the east coast of america have now spread right across the continent new states were formed in the west people from the older states and from europe went out into these wild parts round the ohio where the new states called ohio kentucky and tennessee grew up although these states were called the west they are of course in the eastern part of the continent they are west from the older states but beyond them lies more than half the continent before the middle of the nineteenth century all this was won by the united states the great province of louisiana which napoleon took from spain was sold to the united states for three million pounds further west still some of the land belonged to the hudson's bay company and some to mexico but the united states got it all in the end until the republic stretched from coast to coast at first these settlers in the wild west led a very hard life indeed there was plenty of rich land which gave them food but the only way of getting things made in other countries was to have them carried in ships along the rivers this was a very slow way when the distances were so great and it was not until railways were invented that the western states were able to send great quantities of the things they grew to the eastern states and to europe and so get back the things manufactured there and so lead more comfortable and less rough lives the end of slavery in the new states just as in the old southern states there was a great deal of cotton grown and slaves were used on the plantations but everywhere in the nineteenth centuries we shall see there was a new love of freedom growing up and people began to think it a shameful thing that men should own their fellow men as though they were cattle about the time that the war between the american colonies and england broke out a great english judge had declared that any slaves setting foot on english soil became free at that moment in a few years 
Parliament did away with all the slave trade in English ships, and paid twenty million pounds to slave owners in her colonies in the West Indies and South Africa to set their slaves free. It was not long before other European countries followed her example. It was in the southern states of America that the greatest number of slaves were. The owners of the big plantations had dozens of them, doing the work of the house as well as the plantations. The men would work on the plantations, and the women would be cooks and nurses in the house. Their little children grew up on the plantation and belonged to the master, too. Many slaves were happy, for they had good masters, but they were never safe. Cruel masters might beat them, or, worse still, sell their wives and children to other people. A family might be broken up and never see each other again. This was very dreadful. At last the men of the northern states said that all the slaves should be set free. A lady wrote a story called Uncle Tom's Cabin, which told all about the sufferings of the slaves, and at last the men of the north could not bear the idea that there should any longer be slaves in their country. They wanted a law passed to free all the slaves. They said that the government could give money to the slave owners to make up to them for losing their slaves. But the men of the south were very angry. They said they would never agree to this. In the North, slavery was abolished, and the men of the North were very angry against the South. John Brown, a northerner, went to Virginia, and calling all the slaves he could find to follow him, he told them to fight for their freedom. But he was taken prisoner and hanged. He had certainly been acting against the law, but the northerners were very indignant. At last the southern states said they would have a republic of their own, and elected a president. But the northerners said they had no right to do this, and Abraham Lincoln, the president, felt that America would never be safe and strong if it were broken up like this. Abraham Lincoln was one of the greatest presidents America ever had. He had been a poor boy living in a log cabin in the wild western state of Indiana, but he had read every book he could get and had grown to be a very wise man. He was determined to keep the states together even if slavery had to go on in the South, but the Southerners would not listen to him now. A great civil war broke out. There were heroes on both sides and great victories and defeats. The men of the North marched to a battle singing in chorus, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on for they could never forgive the Southerners for killing John Brown. The greatest leader the South had was Jackson, who was called by his men Stonewall Jackson, because they said when men were falling wounded and dead around him, he stood as steady as ever, like a stone wall. In the middle of the war, Lincoln declared that all men were free in North and South alike. Soon afterwards, Stonewall Jackson was killed, shot by mistake by his own men. At last, after two more years of fighting, the southern army had to surrender. Almost every family in North and South alike had lost a father or brother or son in the war. But through much suffering, two great things had been done. The states remained united, and the slaves were free. But Abraham Lincoln, who had done so much for his country, and had suffered terribly when he thought of all the unnecessary waste of men's lives, was himself to die a martyr at last. He was in the theater at Washington one evening shortly after peace was made, when a man from the South shot at him and killed him, shouting, The South is avenged! Lincoln was taken back to be buried near his old home in the Wild West. Today, the United States, whose history we have been able to tell only in this short way, is one of the most wonderful countries in the world. It is covered with great cities filled with people who are among the cleverest in the world. The American love of freedom has become a proverb. Even more than England, perhaps, people feel there that every one should have equal chances, that it does not matter how poor a man may be or how lowly his birth if he has brains and character. Nearly all the greatest inventions now come from America. New York, with its great, wide, straight streets and its mansions of white marble, 
where its rich men and millionaires live, is one of the most beautiful cities in the world, and every year millions of people pour from Europe into the United States. Russians, who find that their own government does not give them enough of freedom. Italians, who seek riches which their own land cannot give them. Norwegians, Swedes, Germans. Many of the most energetic people from all the countries of Europe are going to seek their fortune in the States. It is interesting to see how these all settle down and mix together to form the American people, all speaking the English language which the Pilgrim Fathers took to the land three hundred years ago. One drawback to the good feeling in America is that many of the white people cannot yet believe that the colored people, the Negro descendants of the slaves whom Lincoln freed, are their equals. There is still a great deal of ill feeling, which we can only hope will pass away in time, and the Negroes get their full share of the life of the great republic. End of chapter 41。Chapter 42 of the Story of the World: A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Victor Sheremet. The Story of the World: A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill, Chapter Forty Two, Section Australasia. One strange result of the American War of Independence was the founding of colonies in the Great Continent at the opposite side of the world from Great Britain, Australia. Before that time, men who had committed crimes in England had been practically sold to the American colonists, who made them work on their plantations. After the war, this could not be done any longer, and so when the discoveries of Captain Cook were making people think of Australia, it was thought a good thing to send the convicts out there as colonists. In this way, it happened that in March 1787, nine ships set out for Australia, carrying a large number of men who had broken the laws of England. It was a continent that, for hundreds of years, had been called the Southern Land or Australia. For men who came to know, in one way or another, that such a land existed. Thought it stretched to the South Pole. The Chinese knew of it in the 13th century, and several men are supposed to have discovered it three centuries later. But the first discoverers, about whom we can be sure, were Dutchmen, who in the 17th century sailed along the west coast. The Torres, a Spaniard. Sailed through the sea which separates Australia on the north from New Guinea, and he may have seen the country. And the water is now called Torres Strait after him. The Dutchmen sailed from an island not far from Australia called Java, and it was Abel Tasman who, sailing from there, discovered the island of Tasmania in 1642. The first Englishman to visit Australia was William Dampier, who reached it in 1688. He went there again in 1699 and thought it a very poor country with little growing on the land and only one kind of animal. This, from his description, is now known to have been the kangaroo. The man who found out most about Australia was Captain Cook, who sailed out to make discoveries about the star which is called Venus. In October 1769, he saw the land which is now called New Zealand, and he called the water in which the ship stopped Poverty Bay, because the people who lived there would not help him in any way and were very quick to attack him. He sailed on and came to the east coast of Australia in April 1770. He made the ship stop in a little bay, which lies very near where the large town Sydney now stands. 
He called the bay Botany Bay because there were so many strange plants and flowers there, but what struck him most was the strangeness of the natives. When the ship sailed into the bay, a number of them were cooking their food at a fire, but they took no notice of the ship. They didn't seem to look even when the ship let down the anchor with a great noise. But when the captain tried to set foot on the shore, some of them stood up and threatened him with their spears, even when one of the natives was shot in the leg for throwing a stone, they seemed not to be afraid, and it was with great difficulty that Captain Cook and his men could land. But they did so several times, and before sailing away, they hoisted the Union Jack to show that the land in future belonged to Great Britain. Captain Cook sailed slowly along the coast towards the north, and he called it New South Wales, as he thought it looked like the coast of Wales. He sailed to Cape York, the point of Australia which is farthest north, and again he hoisted the Union Jack before sailing away to England. He was later sent out to Australia again, and this time he visited Tasmania, as well as New Zealand, and he was making discoveries in another part of the ocean when the savage natives of a small island killed him. Brave and clever as Captain Cook was, he never forgot to be kind and thoughtful about his sailors. It was other Englishmen who told the world all about the coasts of Australia, but the land within was not known for many years. Captain Flinders sailed around Australia in 1806, and in 1831 a ship named the Beagle left England with a man on board whose name will never be forgotten. Charles Darwin was sent out on this voyage to find out all he could about the rocks, plants and animals of the countries they visited and it was this voyage that began the work which has helped people to understand more about how the first man came to be born on earth, and has led them to think that man is only the highest of an immense number of animals which little by little, in one way or another, have grown more powerful and cleverer until the highest was born. But it is more important for the present to point out that Darwin in the Beagle went around Australia, New Zealand and Tasmania, examined the coasts very carefully and wrote down what was found out. The first colonists in Australia. But before this many things had happened in Australia. The first colonists consisted of 564 men and 192 women convicts, and about 200 soldiers. They landed in Botany Bay, but Captain Philip, who was the head of colony, didn't find it a good place to live in, so he moved the settlement to Port Jackson, near Sydney. They had brought with them cows, horses, sheep, pigs, goats and fowls, as well as plenty of seed to sow, and farming tools. But at first they found it very hard to make things grow, and many more convicts came, and many years passed before they found out how to till the land and settle down in comfort. In 1793, people who were not convicts began to go to New South Wales, and they were given land and food. Soon the town of Sydney began to grow, and by the beginning of the 19th century it had already schools, churches, a newspaper and a theatre. A few miles inland from Sydney is a range of mountains, and for a long time this prevented men from trying to find out what lay farther inland. But under Captain Macquarie, who became governor in 1809, a trek was opened over the mountains, 
and this led to the discovery of fertile pasture land beyond. An army officer soon showed that sheep could be reared there, and settlers flocked to the new lands. Other parts of Australia were now being turned into convict settlements. Queensland to the north, Victoria to the south, and Western Australia were all colonized by convicts, and all had in consequence at some time to fight against one great peril. The way in which the first convict settlements were governed was unlike an ordinary colony. The men during the day would work in the open air, building houses, tiling the fields and watching the sheep. Then at night they would be brought back before dark to lie in a sort of barracks, guarded by soldiers through the long hot nights, until the cool morning came. Sometimes convicts who had behaved well for a time were lent to a farmer or a shepherd, and then they would have more freedom. They would work very much like any farm laborer although sometimes they were very ill-treated by the farmers who were set over them. In any case, life was very dreary and hopeless, and while it was difficult to escape from the prisons in the towns, it was almost easy to run away from a farm, especially by stealing a horse. So in time many of these men escaped. Some of them had been treated very cruelly, and they meant to have revenge. All of them were breaking the law by running away, and knowing that they would be punished if they were taken again, for there were brutal things done to convicts in those days, and especially in places far from England. They didn't care how cruel they were themselves. Sometimes they would bend together and then march to a lonely farmhouse where they would steal everything valuable and shoot anyone who resisted. Very often they shot people just for amusement. At times they would wait till a number of travelers were on their way to a large town. Suddenly when the coach had reached a lonely spot they would appear and while some of them stood outside holding loaded revolvers Others would take from the travelers everything they had. Naturally, the free settlers and those convicts who had finished their imprisonment and wished to start afresh tried to catch those robbers, who were called bush rangers, because they lived among the bushes and trees which grew not far from the settlements and which had to be removed when men wanted to till the land. But it was not easy. Often the bush rangers paid men in the towns to let them know when they were to be attacked, and there were many good hiding places in the interior of the country, which it was difficult to find, and out of which it was very difficult indeed to get even one or two men if they had guns. It was much worse after 1851, when gold was first found in Australia. Men flocked out from England and great quantities of gold were taken from the mines. When this was found near small settlements it was kept until there was a very large quantity and then it was sent to the nearest large town. Men would go with it to protect it, but this didn't prevent the bush rangers waiting until the gold train had reached some suitable place when they would suddenly shoot a number of the men and force the rest to let them take the gold. Sometimes they were daring enough to march into a town and attack the bank. One very famous bush ranger was called Ned Kelly. His brother Daniel had stolen a horse in Victoria and when the policemen came to take him, Ned shot at one and wounded him. Then he had to run away. He was joined by other bad men, and though eight thousand pounds was offered to anyone 
who would take the men, they were not taken for two years. They were at length traced to a wooden hut in June 1880, and the police surrounded it. All but Kelly were shot, and he was taken and hanged. This was the last of the bush rangers, but it is strange to think that they could still exist when Australia had grown so active and so rich, and when people who are still young were alive. Long before the death of Ned Kelly, Australia had begun to settle down into the condition in which it is known today. At first, New South Wales included not only the whole of Australia but also New Zealand and the islands near. But before 1840, South Australia, West Australia, Tasmania and New Zealand were cut off, and before 1860, New South Wales had become almost exactly what it is today. Queensland was the last to be treated as a colony. West Australia was the colony to which the last convicts were sent and it was not until 1868 that transportation was stopped. Even Tasmania had for many years secured the right to be treated as a colony and not as a convict settlement. By the year 1856 New South Wales, the oldest colony, had become a large and rich settlement. In 1850 a university was opened in Sydney, and four years later the first railway was finished and in use. The settlers now wished to choose a parliament from among themselves and to rule themselves, and in 1856 this was agreed to by the Parliament of Great Britain. Each of the other colonies had grown in the same way. First a small settlement was formed then by the industry of the settlers, most of them convicts, the settlement began to grow. Soon towns were made in other parts of the colony, and then the colony was treated as separate from the parent, New South Wales. The colony grew still larger and richer, more free settlers came, and at length it was thought great enough to rule itself. But Australia has not grown without its troubles. The discovery of gold increased the number of free settlers to an enormous extent. And the new colonists were bold and independent men who had respect for themselves and for little else. This made the colonies democratic and it caused the bitter struggles between the early colonists who now owned a great part of the land and the more democratic who thought that the land should be owned by as many as possible. It also did a good deal to bring nearer the struggle between those who work and those who employ, which has resulted in the victory of the workers. When the colonies were all large and rich, Many men began to feel that they ought to join together like the provinces of Canada, each colony making laws for things which concerned itself, but the colonies together making laws for other things. For some years men talked about the new idea, but some people felt so strongly against it that it could not be brought to pass. At length, in 1900, it was agreed to and on 1st January 1901, the Commonwealth of Australia commenced to exist. It has passed some wise laws, one of them being that every man is bound to be trained as a soldier, so that if necessary he will be able to fight for his country. The Commonwealth of Australia is very loyal. Its soldiers fought side by side with the British at Khartoum and in South Africa, and it has recently helped in providing ships for the fleet. New Zealand On his last voyage Captain Cook, 
hoisted the Union Jack in New Zealand, but Great Britain didn't take the country, and explorers belonging to other nations visited the islands. Then in 1814 came Samuel Marsden and a number of English missionaries. And although they taught Christianity to the natives, and in this way persuaded the different tribes to remain at peace with each other, still Great Britain would not look on New Zealand as an English colony. It was not until January 1840 when the British government came to know that France intended to colonize the islands, that an officer of the British Navy was told to go to New Zealand and take possession of them. The French settlers arrived a few months later. But as the land now belonged to Great Britain, they became British subjects. The Maoris, as the natives are called, are not like the natives of Australia. Tall and strongly built, they have a brown complexion and tattoo their bodies in strange patterns. But they are very intelligent. And in the early years of the first colonists, there were many struggles with them. Their courage was extraordinary, and as they had good guns, it took years of fighting to make them understand that the white men had come to the islands to stay, and that they meant to be the rulers. Most of the fighting went on in the North Island. The Maori's favorite way of fighting was to build a stockade, a sort of very strong fence, behind which they dug pits for the men to shoot from. Sometimes great numbers of white men would be killed before the Maoris could be driven from the stockade. Some of them hated Christianity as well as hating the foreigners, and so they fought with great fairness. But others, some of them brave chiefs, fought for the English. Although the first settlers had arrived in New Zealand in 1814, it was not until 1870 that the Maoris were finally conquered. But meanwhile, many changes had taken place. Nine separate colonies had been founded in New Zealand and each had its own way of government, and they had little to do with one another. The colony was allowed to govern itself in 1852. But for years there were struggles between the New Zealand government and the councils which ruled the nine separate states. At length, in 1876 the states were abolished and New Zealand has since been a single colony. It has grown steadily. The land is very good for rearing sheep and so much of it has been divided up into strips for sheep farming. Gold was discovered in 1853, and this brought to the colony great numbers of men who wanted to get rich quickly. Railways and telegraphs soon began to appear. Good roads were made, and men were encouraged to leave England and settle in New Zealand. Like the Australians, the men who live in New Zealand are very loyal to Great Britain, and men they were very eager to go out to South Africa to help the British army in the war. Like the Australians too, they have added to the ships of the navy. The people of New Zealand like the Maoris now, and they get on very well together. The population has grown steadily, and New Zealand is now a rich, prosperous country well governed and in peace. End of chapter 42。Chapter 43 of the Story of the World: A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T. R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 43, The French Revolution. 
A few years after the French had helped the United States of America to win their independence, the French nation itself began a great struggle for freedom. This struggle is the most important thing which has happened in modern times. It is called the French Revolution. All through the 18th century, France was becoming more and more in need of money. The wars of Louis XIV had cost the nation a great deal. Still, Louis had left his country great. But his great-grandson, Louis XV, who ruled after him, was very different. He lived a very bad life, and under him the French wars resulted only in losses. As we have seen, France lost India and Canada. The nation grew more and more dissatisfied. The people had not complained of having an absolute king when he had led them to victory, but now things were different. In some parts of France, the peasants were very poor, though there were very few who were not free. It is often said that it was the terrible poverty of the peasants which brought about the French Revolution, but this is not true. The peasants in many of the German states in Poland and in Russia were in a far worse state, for in those countries they were still serfs, like the peasants in England in the early Middle Ages. They could not leave their villages or marry unless their lords allowed them to, and they still had to work several days each week on their lords' lands, as in the early days of feudalism. Still, though the French peasants were free, they were poor. The French people had to pay great taxes at this time, and it made many of them very angry that the nobles had not to pay any at all. There was a large middle class in France, men who were educated. It was from among these that the leaders of the revolution came. Louis XV died in 1774, and his grandson, Louis XVI, who was only 20, became king of France. He had been married four years before to Marie Antoinette, a beautiful young princess and the youngest of 16 children of Maria Theresa. The queen was a year younger than Louis. Louis XVI was quite different from his grandfather. He was a good and very religious man, but he was not a great king. He did not understand the troubles of France and was not strong enough in character to face the difficulties of his position. Marie Antoinette was at first very merry. She seemed to the French people who saw her driving through the streets of Paris heartless and vain. But she was only a girl. The French never liked her, and she herself never forgot that she was an Austrian. But she, too, showed herself very brave, and she was always a good woman. The American Revolution, with its declaration of the rights of man, seemed a very splendid thing to many of the French. Many French soldiers and officers went over and helped the Americans against the English. Among them was a young French nobleman, the Marquis of Lafayette, who was one of the leaders in the French Revolution afterwards. Men like these thought that France, too, might become happy and free and rich again if her people were allowed power in the government. The old French Parliament, which was called the States General, had not met for 175 years when Louis XVI was persuaded to let it meet again on the 1st of May, 1789. All France was full of joy. The people thought that a new time would commence when France had its parliament like England or America. They forgot that, even when nearly 200 years before the States General had been called by French kings, it had had very little real power. All over France, the people were busy electing their representatives. There were three divisions of the States General, the nobles, the clergy or priests, and the tiers etat, or third estate, representing the people. They were to meet at the Palace of Versailles, and on the day they assembled, the 600 members of the tiers etat walked in procession, dressed in black. Behind them walked the nobles, dressed in bright-colored silks and velvets, and behind them again the king and queen and the people of their court. 
The people cheered the third estate, and were silent as the nobles passed, for it was from the third estate, the representatives of the people, that they hoped all good things would come. They cheered the king too, but grew quiet and sullen again as the queen passed. But she made no sign, only looking up to the balcony where her eldest boy, the little eight-year-old Dauphine, who was dying, was propped up to see the procession. Before a month was over, the little boy was dead, and his younger brother was now the Dauphine. Marie Antoinette shut herself up for a day, and then came bravely out again, for there were signs of trouble in this wonderful new French parliament. The king, in his speech at the first meeting, had told the states general that they must decide among themselves whether the three orders of nobles, clergy, and the tier should sit together as one house or meet and vote separately. Everyone knew that the nobles and the higher clergy would not be as willing to make great changes in the government as the tier would be. It would mean that the two votes of nobles and clergy would make the vote of the tier useless. So the tier declared that the three orders must vote together. Some of the clergy joined them, but the nobles would not. Then the tier with the clergy who had joined them, declared that they were the representatives of the nation, and gave themselves the new name of the National Assembly. They said that the nobles could join them if they liked, and the king could give his consent if he liked, but that it really didn't matter. The queen advised the king to resist, and an order was given that the hall in which the assembly had been meeting should be closed, and that there should be no more meetings until a day when the king was to be present. When the assembly found the door of the hall closed, they refused to break up, but held their meeting in a tennis court nearby. Here they took the famous oath that they would never separate until they had given France a constitution, by which they meant a government in which the people had some part. Louis tried to insist that the orders should vote separately, but it was no use. At Versailles and at Paris, the people were growing angry, and the king had to give way. In Paris, bread was dear, and there were many strangers in the city. The feeling of disorder spread, and the common people in the streets became very rough and violent. There were many men of the middle class in Paris, like the lawyer Danton, who were anxious to get rid of the king and make changes which the assembly had not yet thought of. Three hundred men had been chosen to select the representatives of the people of Paris in the states general. These three hundred now made themselves the rulers of Paris. They began to collect soldiers to guard the city. Many of the roughest people joined this guard, which really became an army ready to fight the king. It was called the National Guard. The Hôtel des Invalides, the home of the old soldiers, was attacked and guns and powder carried off. Then the old prison of the Bastille was attacked. Here was a great quantity of powder and only the governor and a few men to defend it. In a few hours they gave up the prison, but were killed as they marched out. The news of the taking of the Bastille spread over Europe, and people understood that this was a real revolution. Marie Antoinette begged the king to flee away from France with her and her children until this dreadful time should be over, but other people advised him to stay. But many French nobles fled from France to safety, the first of many émigrés, who were to follow them in the next few years. The excitement spread all over France. In many of the country districts, the peasants rose, murdered the seigneurs or lords of the land, or drove them away from their castles. They took the land for themselves, and much of the beautiful furniture in the castles was destroyed. Louis made up his mind to go to Paris, and did so. Lafayette rode before him on a white horse, and all along the road the people shouted, Long live the nation! It was only when the king, pale and anxious, stuck the new colors of the revolution, red, white, and blue, in his hat that they shouted, 
Long live the king! Then Louis went back to Versailles, where the queen was weeping and praying for his safety. But it was not long before the king was back in Paris again. A terrible mob of people poured out from the city to Versailles. Lafayette followed them with some soldiers of the National Guard. The mob broke into the palace and even into the queen's room, but she had fled to her husband's. Lafayette drove the mob from the palace, but still they shrieked and howled to see the king, and Louis stepped out on a balcony for all to see. Then louder cries came for the queen, and she stepped out with her children, the only two left to her, her daughter and the six-year-old Dauphine. But the crowd cried angrily that they did not want any children, and the queen signed to them to go back from the balcony. She stood there looking bravely down at the crowd. One man pointed a gun towards her, but did not fire. Lafayette stepped out on the balcony and kissed her hand. He was very sad now, for the revolution, from which he had hoped so much, was becoming a very different thing from what he had expected. The angry mob still shrieked that their king should go to Paris, and the royal family was led by the crowd to the palace of the Tuileries, where they lived for the next two years, the queen always with her children, frightened to go beyond the gardens of the palace, the king listening to information about the doings of the assembly, giving his consent to what he could, refusing when his conscience told him a thing was wrong. The assembly upset all the old arrangements in France. They did away with the old provinces and divided the country up into districts. Committees were sent out to rule these, but all were under the assembly. But there was so much disorder that the taxes could not be collected. The assembly was in great need of money. There were many men in it who did not believe in any religion at all, and they thought it would be an excellent plan to take the property of the church for themselves. They did so, and the clergy were then paid wages by the state. At the same time, they said that the French church should no longer be under the Pope. To these things, Louis could not agree. At last, in despair, he agreed with the queen that the best thing to do would be to try to escape. Count Fersen, who was a great friend of the queen's, brought them clothes to disguise themselves. The king was to be dressed plainly like a manservant, and the queen as a governess, traveling with the two children. The Dauphine was put into girls' clothes, and his sister, who was the only one of the family who lived through the revolution, said that he looked beautiful. They stole quietly out at ten o'clock one night to where a coach was waiting for them. Count Fersen was the coachman, Outside Paris, another coach waited for them with a German coachman, but things went wrong. The horses fell down, and it took an hour to mend the harness. They missed a third carriage which was to meet them, and then a man named Druet recognized the king. The coach rolled on, but Druet and an innkeeper took horses and raced it to her ends. There the royal family was stopped, just as they were practically saved. The next day they were taken back to the Tuileries again. The king was suspended for a time. That is, the assembly said that he should not have the position of king, but in a short time he was recognized as king once more. He gave his consent to the constitution, which left him very little power, and then the national assembly, having done its work, broke up. But things in France were now in hopeless disorder. A new parliament was to meet, to which none of the members of the assembly were to belong. New men, with no experience, were to rule the country. The king and queen were always hoping that the emperor of Austria and the other kings of Europe would come to help them. They only agreed to the laws which were passed, thinking that in a short time foreign armies would come and free them, and all would be as it had been before in France. At last, the armies did march towards France, the armies of Austria and Prussia. Leopold, the emperor, was the brother of Marie Antoinette. 
Maria Theresa was now dead, but Leopold died just at this time, and his son was not so well able to help his aunt. Still, after long delays, his army came. The king of Prussia sent an army, for he felt that these new things which the French were preaching everywhere were dangerous for every king in Europe. The French knew that the king and queen were riding to the other countries of Europe to help them, and the leaders of the revolution grew more and more angry, as did the Paris mob. It was the French themselves who declared war at last. All the soldiers who could be gathered together were sent off to the borders of France and the Netherlands, and the roughest men in Paris were allowed to join the National Guard. Before this, the Paris mob had broken into the Tuileries. They had stood joking roughly in the very presence of the king and queen, and stuck a red cap of liberty on the head of the little Dauphine. In the end, they had gone away without doing any harm. Many people all over France were now sorry for the king and queen, and kind messages poured in upon them. But once the war commenced, the most violent of the people and the leaders, had things all their own way. Again the mob attacked the Tuileries, and the king and queen with their children and the king's sister fled for safety to the hall where the assembly had its meetings. Day after day they had to be crowded together in a small room used by newspaper reporters, and there they could hear the parliament discussing what should be done with them. At last they were carried off to a prison in the building called the Temple in Paris. They lived here in small rooms very different from those to which they had been used. At first a few friends were allowed to stay with them, but later these were all sent away. Madame de Lamballe, a great friend of the Queen, was driven from the Temple into another prison. By this time, nearly all the nobles and friends of the king who had not escaped from France had been shut up in prison. In the convention, as the new parliament was called, the most violent of the revolutionaries under Marat, a madman whose one idea was a republic in which all the people should have equal power, ordered that the friends of the king in prison should be killed. A band of two hundred men went from prison to prison and murdered them. There was only one woman killed in these dreadful September massacres, as they were called. It was Marie Antoinette's friend, the Princess de Lamballe. As Louis the Sixteenth stood staring out of the window of his prison, suddenly the head of his wife's friend was held up on a spear before his eyes. The king's first thought was to prevent the queen from seeing it, but she had seen it and fainted away. The Execution of the King A week or two later, the convention declared that France was a republic. For the future, they spoke of Louis XVI as Louis Capet. He was a citizen like any other. Then, three months later, Louis was brought to trial as a public enemy. He was found guilty. 361 members voted for his death and 360 against it. He was condemned to die. Already he had been separated from the queen and his children, but they were allowed to see him the night before he died. He was very brave and quite gentle. He made the little Dauphine promise never to take revenge for his death, and then he sent them away and gave his last hours to preparation for death. The next morning he was beheaded in a public square in Paris, assuring the great crowds who were gathered round that he died innocent. Meanwhile, the Prussians and Austrians, who had thought that they had nothing to do but march on Paris, had not been very successful. They had started too late in the season. The weather was bad, and their men fell sick. When the two armies at last fought at Valmay, they found that the French soldiers could not be driven back, and in a few days they marched out of France again. Then the French leaders at Paris were full of joy. They made up their minds to help all the peoples of Europe to set up republics too. 
Their armies overran Belgium and joined it to France. Another army did the same in Savoy, on the borders of France and Italy, and another conquered the German states on the Rhine. They then declared that they would attack England and help the English Republicans to set up a republic. In this they were quite mistaken, for no one in England wanted a republic. Then came the execution of the king. Soon France was standing alone against Europe. England, Holland, Spain, Austria, and Prussia were at war with her. The people in the south and west of France rose in rebellion. In La Vendée, a district in the west of France and running along the coast south of the river Loire, the peasants rose to defend their seigneurs and their religion. They nearly drove the Republicans out of the district, but now the Jacobins, the worst revolutionaries of all, got power, and what is known as the Reign of Terror began. Everyone who was suspected of being against the revolution was brought up before judges appointed for that purpose. There was no real trial. Practically, everyone suspected was put to death. Some were nobles, but others were mere peasants. Even girls and little children and old people were put to death. In La Vendée, the revolt was put down, and people were killed in hundreds for being faithful to their lords and their church. It took too long even to behead them all with the guillotine, the great new knife machine which had been invented during the revolution, and so hundreds were thrown into the river to drown. Men who were violent, but not violent enough, were seized and condemned to death in their turn. Madame Roland, the wife of one of the leaders, had exclaimed when she was led out to die, O oh, liberty, what crimes are committed in thy name? For in the end she too was guillotined. But the queen's turn had come before this. Her children had been taken from her in prison, and she too was tried and condemned to death. She was old and white before her time, and blind in one eye through the cold and damp of her last prison. For her last days were spent not even in the temple, but in the common prison. From there she was drawn, sitting on a cart, with her hands tied to be guillotined before the Paris mob. Her little boy died in prison after being treated with the greatest cruelty, but her daughter was at last sent to her mother's relations in Austria. A girl from Normandy, called Charlotte Corday, traveled up from the country to Paris and stabbed Marat to the heart for his cruelty. She was killed in her turn. Danton and Robespierre, great leaders of the revolution, were killed too. At last the reign of terror came to an end. France was winning victories on all her boundaries. Now that Robespierre was gone, the people all over France asked for a complete change of government. They turned against the Jacobins, who were left, and many of these were massacred in their turn. After a time in which religion had been attacked so cruelly, the people were now again crowding to the churches. Many of the emigres came back to France. It was thought, even, that the little Dauphine, who was still alive in prison, might be made king, but this was not to be. At last, a new constitution was set up. It consisted of two houses of parliament, and at the head, five men called the directors. But in the lower house of the new parliament, many of the Jacobins were to sit again. There was a great deal of disorder at the elections, and a young officer called Napoleon Bonaparte was called in by Barras, the head of the government, to put down an insurrection. In this way, this young officer became important. We shall see what a great part he played in the history of France and the world in the next twenty years. End of chapter 43「Chapter Forty Four of the Story of the World: A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 44. The Story of Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte was born of a good family in the island of Corsica in the year 1769, the year after Maria Antoinette was married to Louis XVI of France. Corsica had for many years been fighting for its independence against Genoa, but had at last been sold by that state to France. So Napoleon Bonaparte, though he was Italian by birth, was a subject of the French king. When he was a boy, he was fond of playing with a drum and sword, and his father made up his mind that he should be a soldier. When he was ten years old, he was sent to France to be trained at schools for boys intending to join the army, and he became a lieutenant in an artillery regiment when he was sixteen. When the revolution broke out, Napoleon, although he had never been very fond of France because of its conquest of Corsica, was filled with enthusiasm for it. Corsica sent representatives to the Tier Etat, and all the reforms which were made in France were carried out in Corsica too. In the first years after the beginning of the revolution, Napoleon Bonaparte lived quietly at lodgings at Auxon, where his regiment was stationed, and did all he could to educate his young brother Louis, who lived with him. Their father was by this time dead, and Napoleon was looked upon as the head of his family, although he was only the second son. The other officers in his regiment were royalists, and Napoleon was very lonely, for he could not mix freely with them. He had always been fond of history, and he read now all he could find, being especially fond of Julius Caesar's own account of his wars in Gaul. He had to take his sister home to Corsica when the convent at which she was a pupil was broken up by the revolutionaries, as so many convents and monasteries were. But it was not long before all the Bonapartes had to leave Corsica, for Paoli, the chief man in the island, turned against France after the death of the king and joined himself with England to fight against France. The Bonapartes went to France. Napoleon had a better chance of rising quickly as an officer because the army was in great need of good officers through the loss of so many royalists. He first won great praise for himself by the way in which he helped in the attack on the royalists at Toulon in 1793. They had let British and Spanish soldiers into the town and the Republicans were afraid that more and more might come and that a great attack might be made on France from this port. The first officers sent against Toulon did very little good. One of them was an artist who knew nothing about fighting. It was Napoleon who pointed out the weak side of the town where the attack could be made. The town was conquered, and an English invasion of France by way of Toulon was now impossible. After this, Napoleon helped a great deal in fortifying places along the coast of France. He still spent all his spare time in studying the science of war. The help which he gave the Directory in putting down the insurrection in Paris in 1795 made him great. He had fallen in love with Josephine du Beauharnais, the widow of a French noble who had been executed during the Revolution. Josephine was very lively and beautiful and one of the greatest women in France at the time. She was a friend of Barras, the chief man in the directory, and he persuaded her to marry Napoleon. She was six years older than Napoleon and did not care much for the thin, pale-faced officer, but she at last agreed to marry him, though she would not go with him two days after the marriage to Italy, where he had got the command of the French army. The attack on Italy was part of the war against Austria, to whom most of the north of Italy belonged. Two other armies were to march through Germany and attack Vienna. Napoleon was only one of the generals of the Republic, 
but he knew that he was the best soldier of his time, and he had already made up his mind to imitate Julius Caesar and to make himself dictator of France, and of as much of Europe as he could win. It was a wonderful plan for this young Corsican officer even to think of, and more wonderful still is the fact that he nearly carried it out, and that for years he kept all Europe struggling to overthrow his power. The Emperor of Austria had the King of Sardinia to help him in the north of Italy, but Napoleon always tried to keep his enemy split up, and prevented the army of Piedmont which was under the rule of the king of Sardinia, from joining the Austrian army. And soon the king of Sardinia made his peace with Napoleon, giving Piedmont up to France. Napoleon then easily conquered the Austrians and took the north of Italy. He made the people pay him money, and he chose some of the most beautiful of the art treasures of Italy to send back to France. Before this, Prussia and Spain had been frightened into making peace with France, and Spain and Holland were even helping that country at this time. But England was still the greatest power on the sea, and victories were won over both the Spanish and Dutch fleets. Now, in 1797, Austria made peace and agreed to give up the north of Italy to France. The Great Lord Nelson England was now left alone to fight the French. When Napoleon got back to Paris, it was quite plain that he could do just what he liked. But he did not have himself made dictator yet. He pretended that he was going to invade England, but he really intended to sail to Egypt, conquer it, and Syria, and from there perhaps win both India and Europe. When Napoleon sailed off to the east, Part of the British fleet under Sir Horatio Nelson followed it. Nelson was soon to show himself the greatest of English seamen. He was a small, delicate-looking man, but he was a splendid sailor and soldier, and had been at sea since he was twelve years old. A story is told of him that, when he was still a young midshipman, he was on a ship which sailed into the ice-bound seas near the North Pole. He and another boy stole away one night to see if they could find and shoot a bear. A fog came on, and the captain was very anxious when he knew that the boys were missing. But when the fog melted away, he saw them far off, ready to attack a bear. The captain called to them to come back to the ship, and the other boy did so. But Nelson cried out, begging the captain to let him have just one blow at the bear. But the captain had a shot fired which frightened the bear away. When Nelson got back to the ship, the captain scolded him, but he said sorrowfully, I wanted to kill the bear and take its skin home to my father. Horatio Nelson never knew what it was to be afraid. When the fleet under Nelson came up with the French fleet, they were anchored in the Bay of Abakir, close to the shore of Egypt. Napoleon was already fighting on the land and winning Egypt from the Mameluk. Nelson ordered five of his ships to sail in between the French ships and the shore, for, he said, where the French ships had room to swing, the English had room to anchor. In this way, the French ships were caught between two fires. The battle began at sunset and went on all night. By morning, eleven of the thirteen French ships had been destroyed or taken. The French admiral's flagship had blown up, and the admiral himself had been killed. It was on this ship that the ten-year-old boy, Casa Bianca, died standing at his post on the burning ship until his father should give him leave to go. His father was already dead, though Casa Bianca did not know it, and the brave boy died too. Nelson was wounded in the forehead, but he had won the great battle of the Nile. After this, no other fleet had any chance against the English in the Mediterranean. Meanwhile, Napoleon went on from Egypt to Syria, which he meant to win from Turkey. But he could not take Acre, which the English officer, Sir Sidney Smith, helped to defend. 
Then, suddenly, Napoleon slipped back to France in a fast-sailing ship. He was much needed there, for trouble was threatening the directors from all sides. Napoleon was greeted with joy as the conqueror of Egypt. He was wise enough not to say much about Syria. When Napoleon left France, England was the only country at war with the Republic, but he came back to find that a new coalition had now been formed against her. England, of course, was in it, for it was England from the first who was most determined to resist the attacks of France on the lands of Europe. Russia and Austria were the other chief members of the coalition. While Napoleon was away, the Directory had been in great need of money, and they had actually sent an army to attack Rome, where there were a few Republicans. The old Pope, Pius VI, was a very good and gentle man, and Rome had been quite happy under him, far happier than it was now when the French turned it into a republic, and then took as much money and as many of its art treasures as they could get. The people of Europe were horrified to hear that the Pope had even been roughly treated, his staff dragged from his hand and his ring from his finger. He was carried off to Siena and then to Valence in France, where he stayed till he died. The French soon made themselves hated in Rome. For the same reason they set up a united republic in Switzerland, calling it the Helvetian Republic. The cantons, as a division of Switzerland were called, were each used to governing themselves and did not want this new form of government. The Kingdom of Naples, whose queen, Marie Caroline, was a sister of Marie Antoinette, was also turned into a republic, though here very few of the people wished for this change. When the coalition began to fight, the French were defeated in North Italy by the great Russian general Suvorov. Suvorov was a very wonderful general. He never dreamed of failure, and when he had fought and won a battle, he always still had strength to pursue the enemy as they fled. His men took the same courage from him. His commands before a battle were almost amusing from the confident way they would begin with such words as, The hostile army will be taken prisoners. The king and queen of Naples were given back their kingdom, and Nelson's fleet stood by to defend them. In Switzerland, an Austrian officer led an Austrian and Russian army against the French, but could not drive them out. Still, things were going very badly with the French when Napoleon got back from Egypt. The people were quite tired of the directory. The Abseis, a priest, who had been making constitutions ever since the revolution began, had another one ready now. The worst of paper constitutions, that is, constitutions which are drawn up out of a man's head without any experience of how they work, is that they very seldom will work at all. This new constitution of the year 8, as it was called, for now in France the years were counted from the year 1, the first year of the destruction of the monarchy and the setting up of the republic was carefully drawn up so that power was divided between many people and nobody had any real power at all. Napoleon thought it would be a very good constitution indeed with one change. At the head of all the other parts of the constitution there should be a first consul, and he should be Napoleon himself. Napoleon had his great army behind him ready to fight for him to a man and the French people had no chance to say no, even if they had wished. But they were tired of disorder, and were only too glad to have a strong man to govern them. For the first consul was just as absolute as any king of France had ever been. Four years afterwards he was given the name of emperor, but he was the all-powerful ruler of France from the moment he became first consul at the end of the year 1799. The few serfs who were still remaining in France at the Revolution became free. The property which had been taken from the church and given to other people was not given back, but the churches which had not been given away were. 
peace was made with the Pope, and the Catholic religion was made the religion of the state again, but the priests were to be servants of the state and paid by the government as they are still in France today. So many changes which the revolution had made remained, but there was no real democracy or self-government, which was what the Republicans had fought so hard for. Each district in France was governed by men chosen by Napoleon, so that he had the whole government of the country in his hands, just as much as Louis the Fourteenth had had. The people were not more free under Napoleon in many ways than they had been before. The freedom of the press, which the revolutionaries had given, by which any man could publish any book he liked, was now stopped. Every book had to have the consent of people appointed by the emperor. Then, too, Napoleon could imprison or send anyone out of the country just as he liked. He had his spies everywhere to watch the people and inform him if anyone was dangerous to the government. As time went on, too, Napoleon became more and more anxious to have a magnificent court. The old nobles who were willing to come back were gladly received, for Napoleon liked to have men with high-sounding names around him. The revolutionaries had said there should be no new titles, but Napoleon loved to make men dukes for their services to him, and a new nobility grew up around him. His coronation with Josephine in 1804 was a very gorgeous affair. Napoleon had persuaded the new pope, Pius VII, to go to Paris for the coronation, but when the moment came, he preferred to put the crown on his head himself. Napoleon was dressed for the ceremony in a red velvet coat and over it a purple robe of velvet trimmed with ermine while Josephine knelt beside him in white satin and diamonds. Russia had by this time made peace with Napoleon for the Tsar Paul admired him very much and had only really been led to declare war against France because Napoleon had attacked the Turks and Russia thought that the western countries of Europe should leave the east alone and that if anyone won land from Turkey, it should be Russia herself. So now Napoleon had England and Austria to fight. He knew that a large Austrian army was at the foot of the Italian side of the Alps, near the Mount St. Bernard, a very difficult place. But he led his men across. It was a very difficult march with cannons and baggage, but Napoleon's soldiers could do almost anything. They fought the Austrians and won the great battle of Marengo. In Germany, another of Napoleon's generals won the Battle of Hohenlinden, and now Austria, too, made peace, leaving Napoleon with all his conquests. And so once more England was left to fight France alone. Russia had persuaded Sweden, Prussia, and Denmark, all the countries with ships on the Baltic, to complain of the way in which England treated their ships. England had forbidden ships of countries which were not at war to carry things between countries which were at war and other things which were quite right. For if England had not forbidden these things, a country like Sweden could have helped France very much against her without declaring war. But now these countries complained and England had to fight them. A fleet was sent to Denmark under Nelson, but over him was Sir Hyde Parker, who was not nearly so fine a fighter or officer as Nelson. He sent messages to the Danes, hoping to be able to make an agreement without fighting. This made Nelson very impatient, but the Danes were obstinate, and so a great battle was fought outside the harbor of the city of Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark. It was a hard fight, and in the middle of it, Sir Hyde Parker, fearing that the English could be defeated, put up a signal, cease action. Nelson did not see it at first, and when someone told him of it, he put a telescope to his blind eye, for he had lost one eye and an arm, too, in battle some years before, and said, 
I do not see the signal, and so went on fighting. He was right, for the English won a great victory. The Danes promised to give up their fleet, and now Napoleon had no more hope of destroying England's power on the seas. Soon after, the Tsar Paul died, and his son Alexander became king. Though Alexander admired Napoleon too, he was much under the influence of his mother and her friends, and he was persuaded to give up the friendship with France. So England had her way, after all, about the ships of the countries which were not at war. Just at this point, the younger Pitt, the son of the great Earl of Chatham, gave up his position as head of government in England. It was he who had been so determined to fight the French, and Napoleon took advantage of his absence to arrange a peace with England. A peace was signed, but it did not last long. Napoleon never meant it to. He hated England with a bitter hatred. So far he had been able to conquer the old-fashioned armies of the European countries, but everywhere the English had won by sea. These victories of the English were partly owing to the fact that the English were a real nation, while the feeling of nationality was not awake yet in Europe, except perhaps in France itself. The armies of Austria made war on Napoleon because their emperor told them to, but they had no great interest in the battle. Later on, when the peoples of Europe began to hate Napoleon, things were different. The younger Pitt came back to power in 1804 and immediately began to plan another coalition. But even before this, Napoleon was building a great fleet of flat-bottomed boats in which he hoped to carry soldiers across to England and conquer it. He knew that England had no great army to meet his, but already Englishmen everywhere were offering themselves as volunteers and drilling hard so as to be able to fight the French when they came. Napoleon ordered Spain, whose weak king Charles IV was entirely in his power, to build a fleet too. The French and Spanish fleets were to sail to the West Indies, and Napoleon hoped that the greater part of the British fleet would follow them. Then the remaining French fleet would easily destroy the English fleet in the Channel and land the Army of England in England. But things went wrong. The English fleet watched the others too well, and the whole plan failed. Meanwhile, Pitt had got his coalition, when Russia and Austria joined him once more in war against Napoleon. One thing which made the other countries very angry was the way that Napoleon behaved when in 1804 he found out a plot to kill him and put the uncle of Louis XVI on the French throne. This uncle, who was called Louis XVIII by the royalists, was in England, and Napoleon could not get at him, but he ordered French soldiers to arrest the Duc d'Enguillon a young prince of the French royal family who was living in one of the German states. Napoleon had no right to arrest a prisoner in any other country. This was an insult in itself, but people were still more horrified to hear that the young prince had been shot by order of Napoleon, although he had not had anything to do with the plot. The Death of Nelson in October 1805, Napoleon, seeing that he could not land his army in England, sent it across Europe to fight the Austrians in Bavaria. It won a great victory at Ulm, but two days after, Nelson won another victory at sea, the victory of Trafalgar. The Battle of Trafalgar was fought off the Spanish coast near the Cape of Trafalgar. The English, under Nelson, fought the united fleets of France and Spain. The ships fought close together in a terrible struggle, and the English almost completely destroyed the enemy's fleets. At the beginning of the fight, Nelson ordered the famous signal to be made to all his ships, England expects every man to do his duty. But Nelson, at the head of his line of ships, on his own ship, the Victory, was wounded in the breast. 
His coat was covered with medals, which he had refused to take off when someone suggested that the enemy would recognize him through them and shoot specially at him. But as he was carried down below deck to die, he covered them and his face with a handkerchief, lest his men should see that he was dying and be discouraged. Before he died, he knew that the victory had been won. Almost his last words were, Thank God I have done my duty. And then he asked his friend Captain Hardy to kiss him. We may still see Nelson's ship, the Victory, at anchor outside Portsmouth Harbor. Very quaint it seems to us today when we compare our own ironclad man of war with this battleship of a hundred years ago. In spite of Trafalgar, Napoleon seemed all powerful, for after Ulm, he won a very brilliant victory at Austerlitz, and once more Austria and Russia made peace with him. At the beginning of the French Revolutionary Wars, the leader of the revolution had tried to set up republics all around France, but now Napoleon did away with the republics and turned them into kingdoms, as he had really made France again. But they were not to be independent kingdoms. Most of them were ruled by Napoleon's brothers or his generals, and all, of course, had to do exactly what the emperor told them. All Napoleon really cared for now was victory and power. He drove the king and queen from Naples and put his brother Joseph there as king of the two Sicilies. Holland, or the Batvian Republic, now became a kingdom again under his brother Louis. The electorate of Hanover, which belonged to the English king, was taken and for a time given to Prussia, but later, with some other states joined to it, became the kingdom of Westphalia, and over this another brother, Jerome Bonaparte, reigned as king. Napoleon had himself crowned king of North Italy. The smaller German states he joined together under his protection and called them the Confederation of the Rhine. As though to make all these changes in Europe the more remarkable still, the Emperor of Austria gave up his title of Holy Roman Emperor, which had been so carefully treasured and handed down through the Middle Ages, and called himself for the future of the hereditary Emperor of Austria. Napoleon would dearly have loved the title of Roman Emperor for himself. All this Russia and Austria had to agree to when the coalition broke up in 1806. Soon after this, William Pitt died. Charles James Fox, one of the greatest statesmen of the day, who had at first been enthusiastic about the French Revolution because of its cry for freedom, now tried to make peace with Napoleon too, but failed. Now at last the King of Prussia, Frederick William III, declared war too against Napoleon, but his army was completely defeated in the Battle of Jena, and Napoleon marched to Berlin, the Prussian capital. Then Russia joined the army of Prussia, but both were defeated, and Napoleon and Alexander of Russia met and made the Peace of Tilsit. They met in a raft on the middle of the river at Tilsit. Napoleon cleverly did all he could to make the young Tsar admire him. When he had done this, he flattered him by suggesting that they too should divide Europe and Asia between them. Napoleon's idea was that he himself should be emperor of the West, by which he meant all Europe except Russia and Sweden, while Alexander should be emperor of the East and be allowed to win power over Sweden and Turkey. The idea pleased Alexander very much. For five years, Napoleon and Alexander were friends. Napoleon's first idea after the Peace of Tilsit was to try once more to ruin England. He forbade every country in Europe to trade with Britain. As every country in Europe depended very much on the things brought to them in English ships, this would have been very difficult. 
the countries of Europe still bought things brought in English ships and had to pay more for them because of the extra difficulties. Even Napoleon had to buy cloth for his soldiers' clothes from England. The two most faithful friends which England had were Sweden and the little kingdom of Portugal. Alexander of Russia was left to deal with Sweden. Alexander attacked Sweden, whose brave king, Gustavus IV, was made to abdicate because he would not give up his friendship with England. His uncle was made king of Sweden, but had to agree that one of Napoleon's generals should be king after him. He had to give up Finland, too, which was now taken by Russia. While Napoleon made up his mind to punish Portugal, he thought it would be easy enough. He made up his mind to send a French army into Spain, and he asked the chief officer of the Spanish king to join a Spanish army with it. These two armies poured into Portugal, and the royal family and all the greatest men of Portugal took refuge in the fleet. Some English ships came to protect them, and they sailed off to Brazil. Meanwhile, there was much quarreling between the King Charles IV of Spain, who was almost an imbecile, and his son Ferdinand, who was not much better. Napoleon asked them both to meet him at Bayonne, and there he threatened Ferdinand, who called himself already King of Spain, because his father had abdicated, that if he also did not give up his claim to the throne in a few hours, he should be treated as a rebel. So Ferdinand gave up his rights to his father again, but Charles IV had already sold his kingdom to Napoleon for a palace in France and a pension. Then Napoleon offered the crown of Spain to Louis, his brother, remarking that the climate of Holland did not suit him. But Louis refused, and it was then given to Joseph Bonaparte, who gave up his kingdom of the two Sicilies to one of Napoleon's generals. Spain's Struggle with Napoleon But while Napoleon had been busy making all these arrangements, he had forgotten all about the Spanish people. It was a dreadful mistake. They were very angry indeed when they heard that their country was being bought and sold in this way. National feeling in Spain rose against Napoleon. The people were determined to fight this conqueror and tyrant. Every peasant took up arms, and though the armies of Spain were made up of men who had not fought before, they soon showed themselves able to fight the French armies on equal terms. The siege of Saragossa, the capital of Aragon, is among the famous sieges of history. There were only a few hundred Spanish soldiers to hold its low brick wall against a large French army, but women and children and monks and nuns, as well as the ordinary men of the city, did their part to help. The children carried the cartridges which the nuns made. When the hospital where the wounded soldiers lay was set on fire, the women carried the men from their beds through the flames. At another place, an army of 18,000 French had to surrender their arms to an army of young Spanish soldiers quite new to war. The tale of these things spread through Europe. The English sent armies too to help the Spaniards, and so began the Peninsular War. In this war there fought on the English side Sir Arthur Wellesley, who afterwards became famous as the Duke of Wellington, he had already won great victories for England over the natives of India, who had risen against the English when Napoleon had sent them word that he was coming to help them drive the English out of India. Wellesley landed in Portugal in August 1808 and drove the French armies right out of that country. This was a great gain, for now England had a country from which she could attack Napoleon over land. Sir Arthur Wellesley was called back to England, but Sir John Moore in the same winter prevented Napoleon, who had now come unexpectedly, from conquering the South. Sir John Moore had to lead his men over the ridges of the hills of Galicia to Coruna, where he expected English ships to take his worn-out soldiers back to England. 
It was one of the greatest retreats of history. The hills were covered with snow. Every now and then the English had to turn and fight the foremost of those following them. Napoleon did not follow long, for he had to go back to Germany, but one of his generals took his place. At last, when they reached the coast, the English army turned and fought one more great battle. They won, but the noble Sir John Moore was killed. Every child knows the poem which tells about his burial. Then Sir Arthur Wellesley came back to Spain. For five years he fought against the French generals there. The Spanish armies were not much use to him, but the ordinary peasants and working people helped him very much. He had to fight the great battles himself, but wherever a few French soldiers were met by peasants, they were attacked and killed, for the Spaniards were now full of hate for the French, who had tried to buy and sell their nation. During five years, Napoleon had to leave 250,000 soldiers to fight in Spain, while he himself was fighting in other places. He always thought that his officers there were fighting badly. It was a long time before he understood what a great soldier Wellesley was, though at last he said, so the story tells us, this Wellesley seems to be a man indeed. He did not then know that this same Wellesley, as Duke of Wellington, was to overthrow his power at last. The example of Spain filled the peoples of Europe with enthusiasm. Up to now, there had not been any real national feeling in any country of Europe except England. In the east of Europe, as we have seen, districts were bought and sold and handed about from one country to another. But now, things were different. The peoples in Europe began to hate Napoleon, just as the people of Spain did. The French Revolution itself, though it now seemed a failure, had spread new ideas of freedom among the peoples of Europe. Napoleon himself, though he would have no government by the people, which was what the leaders of the revolution had wanted, made many reforms in the countries he conquered. Better laws and justice were given. In France, much better schools were set up, and Napoleon tried to have even the poor boys in the countries he conquered educated, though he thought that education did not matter at all for girls. They were best at home with their mothers, he thought. He was very old-fashioned indeed on this subject, but perhaps the greatest reform of all was the setting free of many serfs in the east of Europe. With this freedom, the peasants began to feel a hope and pride in the countries to which they belonged. The defeat of the Prussians at Jena made that people very angry, and a great Prussian statesman named Stein now arose and made many reforms in Prussia. The serfs were free, and every young man was trained in the army. Many of these things were what Napoleon himself had advised in other countries, but when he found people doing these things for themselves, he was afraid, for he knew that the love of freedom would grow and that the nations would rise against him. So he made the king of Prussia send Stein away. But he could not destroy the work he had begun. A new love of freedom spread through all Germany, a sort of excitement like that which had moved the men of the Renaissance. New German poets, like the great Goethe, began to write, and the young men of Germany joined themselves in secret clubs and societies, determined to drive the hated foreigners out of their land. The little district of Tyrol had belonged to Austria for 400 years, but now it had been given to the king of Bavaria. It rose in revolt. Tyrol is a country of mountains where simple peasants lived, but it was the peasants who were now showing themselves so brave everywhere. They were led by Andrew Hoffer, a village innkeeper, a tall man, strong as a giant. The peasants rose under him and won their country back for a time, but they were defeated later and Hoffer was shot. Meanwhile, Napoleon had defeated the Austrians once more at the Battle of Wagram. 
the emperor of Austria was forced to make peace, and he was forced to allow an Austrian princess, the Archduchess Marie Louise, to marry Napoleon. The Empress Josephine had not had any children since her marriage with Napoleon, and he longed above all things to have a son to hold his empire after him. So now he divorced Josephine in spite of her begging him not to do so. She lived quietly by herself after this, and the Emperor sometimes visited her. He was full of joy when Marie Louise had a son, who is generally called the young Napoleon. He did not know that, while his son was still a little child, he would lose the empire he had meant to hand on to him. The Fall of Napoleon Napoleon seemed now more powerful than ever. The English armies which were sent to help in Europe were not sent to the right places, for the second Lord Chatham, the son of the elder Pitt and the brother of the younger, was not a clever man, and it was he who had the arrangement of the war. But now, at last, the friendship between Alexander of Russia and Napoleon came to an end. Alexander would not help Napoleon to try to ruin the English trade, and so Napoleon made up his mind to attack Russia itself. He led what he called his grand army of half a million of his best soldiers, trained now in many years of war. Half of these were French, the rest soldiers from the countries he had conquered. When he reached Dresden with his army, Marie Louise and the little king of Rome, as the baby was called, were with him. The emperor of Austria, the king of Prussia, and other kings were present to do him honor. It was for the last time. And now Napoleon led his great army into Russia. He was sure of victory, but he did not know Russia. On he marched across the vast country, but the heat was terrible, for in Russia the summers are very hot and the winters terribly cold. Many horses died and many soldiers deserted, and the Russian generals, instead of fighting, led Napoleon on across the vast country. Winter was coming on, and Napoleon thought of staying where he was till the spring, but he was impatient. He must conquer Russia and take Moscow at once, and so he pushed on. One battle there was in which he conquered the Russians, but lost 30,000 men himself. A week later, the Grand Army, or what was left of it, reached Moscow. Food had run short, but now all hoped to get as much as they wanted. Napoleon expected that the Tsar would come to meet him and surrender himself and the keys of the capital. But what was his surprise when he reached the city to find the streets empty? There were no people, and worse still, there was no food. Indeed, the city was breaking into flames, for the Russians had preferred to burn their town rather than give it up to Napoleon. And now there was nothing to do but turn back and march across that dreary land through the terrible frost and snow west again. A Russian army blocked the way, and in another battle thousands more men were lost. There was nothing to eat but horse flesh, and the soldiers' clothes froze on them. Napoleon, in the gray overcoat which he always wore, was pale and haggard with anxiety. All the way the Russians attacked the outer parts of the army without giving battle. At the river Beresina, the bridge had been cut down, and the Russians were waiting at the other side. The French built a bridge and struggled across the icy water, but the Russians attacked them, and thousands were driven back into the river and drowned. Napoleon never showed any sign of weakness, but led the remnant of his army on, until at the town of Vilna he heard bad news, and at last left his army and pushed on as fast as he could to Paris. After this, the army fell into disorder, and only a few thousands of the half-million men whom Napoleon had led so proudly into Russia crossed the river Neman and left it again. At Paris, Napoleon said that things had gone well, but that the cold of the winter had caused losses in the army. 
but he could not deceive Europe. The Prussian people now rose and forced the government to declare war once more on Napoleon. Russia joined them, and then Austria. The armies against Napoleon were more dangerous than ever before, but he did not give up hope. He was still able to get together an enormous army, and he won one more victory at Dresden, but at the great Battle of the Nations at Leipzig, he was defeated and driven across the Rhine. Even now, the countries of Europe would have been glad to leave him France for himself, but he would not agree, and so the armies followed him into France. Even now, he won brilliant victories, but he could no longer keep his enemies divided and fight them one by one, as he had so often and so cleverly done before. His generals told him it was madness to resist, and at last the great emperor, who had defied Europe so long, had to confess that he was beaten. At first he offered to abdicate in favor of his son, but none would agree to this. He had to abdicate altogether. But even now the people of Europe hardly dared to suggest that he should become as other men. He was still to be called emperor, but he was to be kept quite safe on the little island of Elba, which was to be the only land left to him. There Napoleon went, and the brother of Louis the Sixteenth came to be the king of France and was called Louis the Eighteenth. A Congress of Representatives of the five great countries of Europe, Russia, Prussia, Austria, France, and Great Britain met at Vienna. There were many things to settle after the terrible confusion of the last 25 years, and the representatives soon began to quarrel. Meanwhile, Napoleon was lonely in Elba, alone with thoughts which drove him nearly mad. Of all he had lost and all he had nearly won, Marie Louise had gone home to Austria and taken her baby with her. She had refused to follow her husband to the lonely island of Elba. Napoleon had joked as he looked down one day from the top of the highest hill in Elba, saying with a smile, It must be confessed that my island is very small. But at last he could bear it no longer. He made up his mind to have one last try for power. He had heard that the new king of France, Louis the Eighteenth was not a man whom the French would love or admire. He knew, too, that his own soldiers had loved him and remembered how the men of his imperial guard had wept when he bade them goodbye. He would go to France and try to win it back again. Soon news came to Vienna that Napoleon had landed in France and was marching to Paris, and that the French soldiers were trooping to his standard, and Louis the Eighteenth had fled. The Congress broke up. Nothing could be done until he was conquered again. Wellington, who had driven the French right out of Spain in 1813, was the man to save Europe. For a hundred days, Napoleon ruled at Paris, getting together once more an enormous army, while Prussia and England and Austria and Russia did the same. But Napoleon was the quickest, and he made up his mind to attack the Prussians under their general, Blücher, in Belgium, then the English under Wellington, before the two armies could join together, and before the Russians and Austrians, who were marching across Europe, should come up to them. He attacked the Prussians at Ligny and defeated them. Blücher then drew his army back towards Wavre, but Napoleon thought he had gone to Namur. Napoleon sent some regiments toward Namur to prevent Blücher joining the English. He then turned to attack Wellington at a place called Quatre Bras, or the Four Roads. Wellington had already fought with one of Napoleon's officers, but neither side won, and now Wellington drew off towards Waterloo, a plain near Brussels. Here Napoleon followed and attacked, and on the 18th of June the Great Battle of Waterloo was fought. It was the first time that Napoleon and Wellington had met to fight each other. 
The English army was posted on a ridge of hills. On the road below, he left men to guard the farmhouse of La Haye Saint, and still further to the right, more men to guard the farm and castle at Hougoumont. The French were drawn up on a ridge at the other side of the valley. Both generals were sure of victory. At half past eleven in the morning, the battle began. Napoleon's plan of battle was to stagger the enemy's front with artillery, and then, before they had recovered, to send in bodies of cavalry to break them up or ride them down. But he could hardly do this with the two farms in the way. The French, therefore, made many determined attacks on La Haye Saint and Hougoumont, but could not take them. It was a tremendous struggle, and very equal, but at half-past four in the afternoon, Blücher, with his Prussians, tired after a long march but fresh enough to fight, came up and attacked the right of the French army. Soon after, Wellington cried, Up, guards, and at them! And the fifteen hundred English guards, whom he had kept in reserve till then, dashed on to the French ranks. The line broke, and the French turned and fled. Only the imperial guards stood close round the emperor. The British begged them to surrender, for they hated to cut down such brave men. The guard dies but does not surrender, was the answer. At last, Napoleon rode sadly from the field. He had lost everything. True, 25,000 English and Prussians lay dead on the field, and Wellington wept as the list was read to him. But it was the end of the great struggle, and Napoleon knew it. He tried to get away in a ship to America, but the shores of France were too closely watched. At last he gave himself up to the officers on the battleship the Bellerophon, which sailed to Plymouth. Meanwhile it had been decided that he should be sent to the island of St. Helena, halfway between the coasts of Africa and South America. There he would be safe. He lived there for six years, with sentinels posted round his house, and an English officer visiting him every day to make sure that he was still there. English battleships lay at anchor round the island to make doubly sure. For the most part, he was calm, and spent much of his time writing down his memoirs, the story of his life as it seemed to him. There is much that is true, and much that is false in his story. Near him were always the portraits of Josephine, who died soon after Waterloo, and Marie-Louise and his son, the young Napoleon, who was never to be emperor after all. Napoleon was buried at St. Helena, but years afterward the French people, remembering his greatness, for he was, after all, one of the greatest men who had ever lived, had his body carried to Paris and buried there in a gorgeous tomb with a circle of great marble figures looking down on the spot where the body of the emperor lies. End of chapter 44「Chapter Forty Five of the Story of the World: A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the World: A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter Forty Five: The Remaking of Europe. The Congress at Vienna had now to begin again the work of putting order into the Europe with which Napoleon had been playing chess for so many years. France was reduced to the size it had been in 1789, before the Revolutionary Wars began. Many of the provinces she had conquered on the Rhine were more French than German, but most of the German states were formed into a loose confederation, and these were included in it. The part of Poland which had been taken from Prussia was given to Alexander of Russia. Holland and Belgium were joined together as one kingdom, and given to the royal house of Orange, the former rulers of Holland. Holland and Belgium were two quite different nations in race and in religion, but no notice was taken of nationality, 
although it was really the spirit of nationalism which had overthrown Napoleon at last. The north of Italy was given back to Austria, and Savoy to the king of Sardinia. The king and queen of Naples went back to their kingdom. Spain had already been given back to Ferdinand the Seventh. The great kings of Europe looked on the French Revolution as a thing which was over. It was to them a kind of bad dream. Some of its ideas had already become part of the laws of the countries, but the Holy Alliance, in which the Emperor of Austria, the Tsar of Russia, and the King of Prussia joined, made it quite clear that they believed in absolute government. They would try to do good things for the people, but the people must not do anything for themselves. So the nineteenth century began. But the ideas of the French Revolution were not dead, and all the nations have been slowly winning the liberty and equality which the Revolution had tried to teach. Louis the Eighteenth was restored to the throne of France once more, but it was understood that he was to give the nation a constitution. France was to have a parliament of two houses, like England. Louis the Eighteenth was a sensible and rather clever man. He had spent his days in exile since the Revolution in Russia, until he was driven away twice by the changing plans of both Tsars, and afterwards in England. He was prepared to be very tolerant and moderate, but the lower house of its first parliament was very violent. The elections had been made while emigres were pouring back to France, and many of the people, especially in the South, were full of relief that the old ways, as they thought, had come back. Many of the people who were known to have been in favor of the revolution were massacred by the peasants, who were full of revenge for all they and their church had suffered. These massacres were afterwards spoken of as the White Terror. The lower house insisted on the trial of some of Napoleon's greatest friends, and the brave Marshal Ney was tried and shot. Many others were driven from the country. But at last Louis dissolved this parliament, and the next was much more moderate. The other countries of Europe had left a large army in France, and France had to pay a great sum of money to help to make up to these countries for the expenses of the wars against Napoleon. But now the army was withdrawn, and things were quiet in France for some years. Perhaps the thing which the French people felt most in the conditions of the peace of 1815 was that most of the beautiful works of art which Napoleon had stolen from all over Europe and brought to Paris had to be sent back. Louis XVIII reigned in France until he died in 1824, and his brother became king, and was called Charles X. Charles X was not such a wise man as Louis XVIII. He was not content to rule as a constitutional king. I would rather Hugh would, he said, than be a king like the King of England. It was under Charles that France won Algiers in the north of Africa, the most prosperous of the French possessions today. But nothing could make Charles popular. He stopped the freedom of the press, and Paris rose in revolt. Once more the tricolor, the flag of the revolution, was seen in the streets. The soldiers and the citizens fought, but the soldiers had never really had much enthusiasm for fighting against the tricolor. The citizens won, for many of the soldiers went over to them. The palace of the Tuileries was again attacked, but the king was not there. When he sent word that he was ready to grant freedom to the press again, he was told that it was too late. He fled to England, where William IV was now king. Many of the Parisians had hoped for a republic once more, but this was not yet to be, and the French crown was offered to the Duke of Orleans, a member of the royal family, who had fought as a young man when the armies of the revolution were attacked by the invaders at Valmy. But Louis-Philippe, though he reigned until 1848, never really suited the French. They wanted more reforms than he could grant. Once more in 1848, an attack was made on the Palace of the Tuileries, and Louis-Philippe had to abdicate in his turn. He was seventy-five when he fled away with his queen into exile. France now became a republic again, with Louis Napoleon, the nephew of the Emperor Napoleon, as its president. He was the son of Louis Bonaparte, the former King of Holland, Napoleon's own son. The King of Rome had died at an age of twenty. He had always been a delicate boy, and he died worn out with longing to be able to do something to win his father's empire back. It was not long before Prince Louis Napoleon was able to have himself proclaimed emperor. He was called Napoleon the Third, as though he had a right to succeed to the son of Napoleon, who was therefore spoken of as Napoleon the Second. So France was ruled by an emperor once more, though not for long. Meanwhile, changes in Europe had followed both the revolution of 1830 and this of 1848. Belgium had rebelled against being joined with Holland, 
and had become a separate kingdom under a German prince, the uncle of Princess Victoria, who became Queen of England in 1837. Hanover could not be held by women, and so no longer belonged to the English sovereign. It was soon joined to Prussia. Poland, filled with the spirit of nationality and wish for freedom, rose against Russia, but the rebellion was put down. With the death of Ferdinand VII in 1833, Spain also got a constitution for a time. Before this, the nations of Europe had been roused to enthusiasm by the struggle of the Greek people for independence against the Turks. The Sultan at Constantinople left the government of the conquered states in the hands of rulers who governed them very much as they liked. These rulers, who were, of course, Mohammedans, were often very cruel to the Christian people like the Greeks, who had borne their rule for centuries. But the new spirit of nationalism was now felt by the Greeks, and they rose in rebellion against the Turks. Terrible fighting took place, for the Greeks were as cruel as the Turks once they had risen, just as slaves are vicious when they have once risen against their masters. At first, the countries of Europe did not interfere, although Russia, and England especially, were in favor of the Greeks. But volunteers from these countries went to help the Greeks. Among them was the poet Lord Byron, who was full of memories of the great days of Greece and enthusiasm for its writers. The modern Greek could hardly be looked upon as the descendants of the old Greeks, for so many Romans and other people had since mingled with the people. Still, in Greece itself, there was a new enthusiasm for the study of the old Greek literature and language. The population of Greece was now largely made up of herdsmen and of soldiers, many of whom were brigands constantly worrying the Turkish rulers. Lord Byron hoped that the glories of old Greece might be restored, and was full of this dream when he landed in Greece to help them to fight in 1824. He went on to Messalonghi, one of the strongest places on the west coast of Greece, but he got fever in the low swampy land and died. Still, he had given the Greeks hope and courage. Messalonghi was besieged by sea and land. The siege lasted a year, and then all the food and powder were gone, but the Greeks would not surrender. They preferred to die, and when they could hold out no longer, men, women, and children dashed out on the Turks and died fighting outside the town they had defended so long. At last, England, France, and Russia sent help to the Greeks, and a great battle was fought in the Bay of Navarino. The Turks were defeated, but there were some years of fighting yet. England did not want to make Turkey too weak, because this would make Russia too strong. But at last, in 1833, it was arranged that Greece should be a free kingdom under Otto of Bavaria, a prince only seventeen years old, as its first king. This new kingdom was to have a constitution, too, so the work of the French Revolution was being slowly but surely done. Hungary, the beautiful country which had so long been under the rule of Austria, although it belonged to quite a different race from the people of that country, now fought for freedom too. For many years the Hungarians had chosen the emperor to rule them, but now it had become a matter of course, and they had no share in their own government, and there was no freedom of the press. In the year 1837, a young Hungarian, Louis Kossuth, set up a newspaper in which the new ideas of liberty found a voice. This did not please the Austrian government, and Kossuth was put in prison for two years. At last he was set free and started his newspaper again. The people looked on him as a leader. When the revolution of 1848 took place in France, the Hungarians hoped more and more for liberty, and Louis Kossuth was sent with some other chosen men to ask for reform in Hungary. The emperor promised, for he was frightened at the moment, but he broke his promises, and then Hungary rose with Louis Kossuth as its leader in a war against Austria. The peasants flocked, armed with knives and hatchets, to fight for their country. They defeated the Austrians many times, but Austria got help from Russia, and thousands of soldiers marched into Hungary. The Hungarians had to give in. Many of the leaders of the rebellion were shot, but Louis Kossuth escaped from the country. The United States sent a ship to carry him over to their land, but afterwards he went to live in Italy, where he died in 1894. But thirty years before this, Hungary had won her freedom after all. Although she remains under the Austrian emperor, her government is quite independent of the government of Austria, and the countries ruled over by the emperor are now called together Austria-Hungary. Soon after Napoleon III became emperor of France, the French people joined the English in a war with Russia. Russia had won Finland, and so became the chief country on the shores of the Baltic. She longed to capture Constantinople and launch her ships on the Bosphorus. Turkey was in a very weak state. The Tsar Nicholas told the English that Turkey was a sick man, a very sick man. He felt that it would be easy to steal all he wanted from the sick man. 
He was willing that England should take Egypt and the island of Crete, and would have liked to take the Turkish provinces in Europe for himself. But England did not want Russia to become too strong, and refused. One reason why England did not care for the Russians to grow too strong was that Russia is the nearest country in Europe to India, which he might try to attack through the passes of the Himalayas. Russia made the Turkish treatment of the Christians in her provinces an excuse for attacking the Turkish fleet in the Black Sea in the year 1854. The Turkish fleet was destroyed and 4,000 Turks killed. So England and France made ready to attack Russia in the peninsula of the Crimea, and so began the famous Crimean War. The English commander was Lord Raglan, who had lost his arm at Waterloo. The English and French knew nothing about the Crimea, but they landed in September 1854 at a place near the mouth of the River Alma. The Russians were drawn up on a ridge of hills on the other side of the river. They fired on the English and French all the time they were crossing the river, but they went bravely on up the hill and broke the Russian line, and so won the first battle of the war. Then they marched on to Balaclava, where again they defeated the Russians but the Battle of Balaclava is best remembered because of the famous charge of the Light Brigade. Through some mistake, the brigade, a company of cavalry, was ordered to cross a mile and a half of the battlefield, where it would be fired on all the time and charge the Russian guns. It was a terrible order, for horse soldiers could not attack artillery in such a way, but though they knew it was a mistake, the brigade knew too that a soldier's first duty is obedience. They made the charge, and few came back to tell the tale. Everybody knows Tennyson's poem on the charge of the Light Brigade. Their courage will never be forgotten. The French general looking on said, It is magnificent, but it is not war. As winter came on, the English and French were besieging Sebastopol. The cold was terrible, and the soldiers were short of clothes. Some ships carrying clothes and blankets were wrecked in Bacalaba Bay, and the things were all lost. When some things did arrive, it was seen that terrible mistakes had been made. Once a great case of boots was unpacked, they were all for the right foot. The men fell ill, and thousands died. Florence Nightingale It was now that Miss Florence Nightingale, an English lady, took nurses out to care for the sick and wounded soldiers at Scutari, where the Turkish barracks had been made into a hospital. But at last, after a siege of 349 days, Sebastopol was taken. So ended the Crimean War. The Black Sea was open to ships of all countries, and Russia was allowed to keep only six warships on it. Ever since the Crimean War, the Christian nations under the Turks in Europe have been longing for their freedom. In 1877, Russia joined the Christians in their struggle, and Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro won their independence. Other provinces were put under the protection of Austria, and afterwards became part of Austria-Hungary. Bulgaria got its own government, but had to pay tribute. It is now quite free. Even today the people of Albania and the districts to the north of Greece are struggling for their freedom from the Turks. They are being helped by the Serbians and Bulgarians and other peoples who have already won their freedom. There are many who feel that things will not be right until the sick man of Europe is driven out of Europe altogether. The Turks are a brave if fierce people, but Christian peoples have never been happy under their rule. Immediately after the revolution of 1848 in France, which once more filled the minds of men all over Europe with the longing of freedom, Nearly every one of the German states demanded a constitution from their princes. There was a feeling, too, that after all, the Germans of all these little states belonged to one race, and that they would be much stronger if they could join together and become one nation. A great meeting was held at Frankfurt to discuss this thing, but there were too many quarrels. Some people wanted to include Austria. Others felt that the Austrians were not really Germans, and wanted all the other states to join with Prussia at their head. This is what happened afterwards, but for the time the idea was given up. But as the years went on, the Germans were more and more inclined to unite. The King of Prussia, William I, had for his chief statesman a great man called Otto von Bismarck. Bismarck was one of the greatest statesmen of modern times. He was stern and strong, and when he made up his mind to do a thing, he did it. The German problem, he said, cannot be solved by parliamentary decrees, but by blood and iron. He knew that before Prussia could make itself the head of a new German empire, there must be a war with Austria. In 1863, Christian IX, the father of the Princess Alexandra, who married the Prince of Wales, afterwards King Edward VII of England, became King of Denmark. For many years the little states of Schleswig and Holstein, which were really German, had belonged to Denmark. But now Prussia and Austria fought Denmark for them. The Danes fought as they have always done, splendidly, 
but Denmark is too small a country to fight against two great powers, and in the end they had to give up Schleswig and Holstein to the enemy. Then Austria and Prussia fought for the states themselves in the Seven Weeks' War. The powerful army which Bismarck had made for Prussia won the victory, and Austria gave up all her power in Germany. The new Prussian province of Schleswig-Holstein gave Germany more power on the Baltic coast. Right across the province there is now a canal which saves the German ships from sailing round the stormy coast of Denmark. It is in the harbor of Kiel that Germany is now building her dreadnoughts, the great warships which many Englishmen fear are being prepared to attack England's supremacy on the seas. When France, under its Emperor Napoleon III, saw the growing power of Germany, it grew alarmed. Bismarck was glad of the chance of war, and in 1870 a war between France and Prussia broke out. The French people were still full of the memory of Napoleon and the great victories which his armies had won. They did not realize how strong the army of Prussia had grown, and how weak their own now was. They went into the war with a light heart. The German states joined readily with Prussia and sent their armies to help the strong Prussian army against France. In all the battles which the Germans won, the conquering army was larger than the French army it defeated. But the Germans were really better prepared for war in every way. The French won the first battle, in which the young Prince Imperial, the son of Napoleon III, fought nobly, but it was their only victory. At the Great Battle of Sedan, the French were surrounded, and though they fought madly, the better trained soldiers of Prussia conquered them. Napoleon III went wherever the shots were thickest. He was hoping to be killed, but at last he made up his mind to surrender, and sent the message to old King William, Not having been able to die in the midst of my troops, there is nothing left for me but to give up my sword into the hands of your majesty. An emperor who could not win battles would never be tolerated by the French. This Napoleon III knew, and he left France forever with the Empress Eugenie. He died three years afterwards in England, broken-hearted. The Empress Eugenie lived for many years in England, loved and admired by all who knew her. But the young Prince Imperial was killed in the Zulu War, fighting nobly for the English people who had given his father and mother a home in their exile. But though the Emperor had surrendered, Paris determined to resist. For four months the siege went on. The starving Parisians ate horses and paid large sums of money for dogs and cats and rats. But at last they had to give in, and when peace was made they had to give up Alsace and Lorraine, two more of those Rhine provinces which were much more French than German. The French have never forgiven the Germans for their defeat in the Franco-Prussian War, and to get back Alsace and Lorraine is the dream of many Frenchmen today. Provinces themselves are still loyal to the French, and it is said that if a visitor asks a peasant girl there today to what country she belongs, she will look cautiously round to see that no one is listening, and then whisper eagerly, France! But one great result of the Franco-Prussian War was that now at last France became a republic, and has been one ever since. After nearly a hundred years, the freedom which the first leaders of the revolution of 1789 had longed for, and which had caused so much suffering to France and to Europe, was won. At the same time, the war made Germany a nation. While the Prussian king was at the palace of Versailles, where he stayed during the siege of Paris, news came that the people of the German states had made up their minds to unite in one empire, and King William I of Prussia became the first emperor of Germany. Each state still governs itself, and has its own prince and its own court, but in all things connected with war and peace and trade, the government of the emperor decides for all. So after many centuries, the German states, which had remained separate since the Middle Ages, became at last a nation. The Making of Italy Meanwhile, Italy, that other country which had been for so long broken up and in the power of other peoples, was becoming a nation too. Early in the 19th century, the same longing for freedom which had begun to spread through the other countries of Europe was felt in Italy too. Young men like Joseph Mazzini, the first great hero of Italian independence, longed to see their country freed from the foreigner and united as one nation. His one thought was the sorrows of Italy. He always wore black clothes to show how he mourned for her. A society was formed of Italians who would work for their country's freedom. It was called Young Italy, and its watchword was God and the people. After the revolution of 1830, some of the Italians rose, but only a few, and they were easily put down. Before this, Mazzini had gone into exile after being in prison for some months, for young Italy was a secret society, and it had been found out that he belonged to it. He went, like so many exiles, to England, 
where he stayed until a new movement began in Italy, after the revolution in France in 1848. All North Italy rose against Austria, and Mazzini went to Rome and set up a republic. The Pope, Pius IX, had at first been very much in sympathy with the idea of the liberty of the people, but had afterwards become frightened at the violence of some of its leaders. He now fled from Rome. But in the north, Austria brought a great army and defeated the Italians, and Prince Louis Napoleon brought an army of Frenchmen and won back Rome for the Pope, in spite of the splendid fighting of Garibaldi, another leader of the Young Italy movement. He, too, had been exiled soon after Mazzini, and had spent many years in war in South America, until he also came back to Italy, when he heard that the people were ready to fight for their freedom. When, after weeks of fighting, he was at last driven from Rome, he fled with his wife Anita, whom he dearly loved, trying to reach Venice, but could not do so, and he was hunted from place to place, over mountains and through forests, until his wife died, worn out. At last he got away to America, where he stayed until ten years later Italy made a last and successful attempt to win its freedom. Many of the leaders of the Young Italy movement would have liked to have made an Italian republic, but they hoped to get help from the other countries of Europe, and they knew they would only get it if they tried to set up a kingdom and not a republic. If they had won in their rising in 1849, Charles Albert of Sardinia was to have been ruler of the lands conquered from Austria. But Austria forced Charles Albert to abdicate, and his son Victor Emmanuel became king of Sardinia. Charles Albert went into exile, and died without knowing that success was to come, and that his son was to be king of all Italy. Victor Emmanuel had for his chief statesman Cavour, the third great leader in winning the freedom of Italy. He saw that Italy could only conquer Austria if she were helped by other countries. In 1859, a French army under Napoleon III marched into Italy to help Cavour against Austria. Nearly all Lombardy was won by them, and then Napoleon, who thought he had done enough, made peace with the Austrians. This would have left Venice and other parts of North Italy to them, but Cavour was terribly angry at Napoleon's behavior, and the people of North Italy all wanted Victor Emmanuel for their king. Garibaldi helped in the struggle, a dark fierce man in the famous red shirt which he always wore. At last, all of North Italy, except Venice, belonged to Victor Emmanuel. There were still the Papal States, Naples and Sicily, to win. Garibaldi begged the North Italians for money to get men and weapons to fight against the King of Naples, who was, of course, a foreigner belonging to the French royal family. Garibaldi took his men to Sicily and called on the peasants to rise. The islanders rose and drove the Neapolitan officers away. Sicily was won for Victor Emmanuel. Then the leader crossed to Naples. The royal family fled, and the people followed Garibaldi. But at the royal palace there were still royal troops. They might at any moment have fired, but Garibaldi stood up in his carriage looking steadily at them. Then they, too, gave way to the enthusiasm of the people for Young Italy. Great cries of Viva Garibaldi, long live Garibaldi, were heard on every side, and Naples was won also for Victor Emmanuel. The greater part of the Papal States had been taken too. All Italy except Rome was now joined under one ruler for the first time since the fall of the Roman Empire. In 1870, when France, being at war, could no longer send an army to defend the Pope, Rome was taken too, and became the capital of the new kingdom. An offer was made to the Pope to pay him yearly a large sum of money. He was to have his court like a king and his soldiers, but he was not to rule over any part of the land. But the Pope would not agree to this. He still lives in his palace of the Vatican, but has never given his consent to the loss of the Papal States. This question of the temporal power, as the Pope's rule over the Papal States was called, is still discussed among Catholics today. There are many who think that the Pope can rule better and more spiritually over the Church now that he is no longer a temporal prince, but others think that he has been robbed of his rights. Especially in Roman society does the quarrel go on. The people are divided between the whites, who are all for the Pope, and the blacks, who are in favor of the king. Meanwhile, the royal and papal courts go on side by side. Certainly it would have been impossible for the great dream of Italian unity to come true if the temporal power had been kept. And so now at last all Europe was divided into nations, and all had constitutions more or less free, except the one country of Russia. Nowhere any longer were there serfs, except indeed in Russia until 1861, where there, too, the Tsar set them free. But in Russia alone there is very little freedom of government yet. The Tsar is as absolute as any king before the French Revolution, or more so. There is no freedom of the press in Russia, and no freedom of thought. 
For years, all men or women who have dared to speak against the government have been sent as prisoners to Siberia, that great tract of land stretching across the north of Asia which Russia won in the 16th century. There the exiles used to be driven in crowds, marching in chains for thousands of miles to the prisons they were never more to leave. Prisoners are still sent to Siberia, but they go by the wonderful Trans-Siberian Railway, which stretches from Europe to the Pacific Ocean. Many Russian exiles are to be found in all the countries of Europe, waiting and hoping till their country too shall be free. There are some who have grown desperate and would destroy all governments if they could. Everywhere else the peoples of Europe are free, and so too in America and Africa and Australia. At the beginning of the 19th century, all South America, except two little districts in the north which belonged to England, were under Spain and Portugal. The people were partly Spanish and Portuguese, but there were many more natives, and many too half-breeds or creoles, people descended from Spaniards who had married natives. When the United States won their freedom from England, and the news of the French Revolution reached South America, ideas of revolution began to spread through South America too. Then, when the Spanish and Portuguese kings were deposed by Napoleon, the South Americans hardly knew who were supposed to be their rulers. This encouraged the ideas of independence which were already spreading. The Portuguese royal family fled to Brazil, but soon after they had returned to Portugal, Brazil became a separate state with a Portuguese prince as its constitutional emperor. At last, in 1889, Brazil became a republic. But things were not done so peacefully in the greater part of South America, which belonged to Spain. In these provinces, there were many royalists as well as republicans, and there were many bitter struggles before the republicans won. One of the great heroes of the struggle was a man named San Martin. For four years, he fought against the royalists in the rich country round the Plata, the great Silver River, but in 1816 he was able to set up the Republic of Argentina. Then Chile arose, but the royalists of Peru defeated the republicans there. There were many strange people in South America, and the leader of the Chileans was an Irishman named O'Higgins. But San Martin marched to his help across the great mountain range of the Andes, and Chile, too, won its independence. After many bitter struggles, Venezuela also won its freedom, though it was twice won back again, and then Bolivar, the hero of Venezuela, joined with San Martin to win Peru. At last, Spanish North America was divided into nine republics. At first, they were often governed by dictators, soldiers who would help to win their freedom for them, but in the end they all became really free republics, and South America rapidly became rich and strong. So here, too, the work of the French Revolution spread. And now even the peoples of Asia are waking up to the idea of freedom, and we may hope that before long all the peoples of the earth will have their liberty. End of chapter 45 Recording by Todd Chapter 46. The Story of the World. A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by D. L. Martin. The Story of the World. A Simple History for Boys and Girls. By Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 46 Africa, the Land of Mystery. Meanwhile, another vast land was becoming of greater importance in the world's history. Africa, as we know it today, can only look back on a history of about 40 years. Within that time, the nations of Europe have agreed to cut it up into pieces, in each of which some European nation rules. Of all that vast continent, only two states are ruled by natives, the Republic of Liberia and Abyssinia. Liberia is the place where slaves who had been set free were allowed to settle down and begin their lives over again in freedom. From 1821 up to about 50 years ago, ships sailed across the ocean from America bringing hundreds of old Negro men and women and children to their new home in that Africa from which their forefathers had been stolen so many years before. The other native state, Abyssinia, is much older, and one of their old stories says that the Queen of Sheba, who visited King Solomon, was a queen of Abyssinia. 
since the struggle with Italy, which ended in the terrible defeat of the Italians in 1896, no one has tried to rob the Abyssinians of their independence. In the rest of Africa, Germany and Portugal each have two pieces south of the equator, one on the east and one on the west side. Between them are the South African Union and other states under Great Britain. At Lake Tanganyika, where this country ends, is the Congo Free State, which belongs to Belgium. North of the equator, Great Britain has British East Africa and Uganda, stretching up to Egypt, to the west of which is the huge desert land reaching to the west coast and belonging to France. Morocco, Algeria, and Tunis are also under France, Tripoli and the westerly part of Africa under Italy, while there are other strips of land on the west coast belonging to France, Great Britain, and Germany. We must now see how all these lands came to be ruled by the nations of Europe. Although the continent of Africa is about three times as large as Europe, and nearly 200 times the size of England and Wales, and has a huge number of people living in it, it is a land of mystery. Part of it, indeed, is called the Dark Continent, but in many ways the whole is dark. There is so little known of it, so much that can never be known. The people who first lived in Africa were probably a small black race, and many of this sort of people still live in the part of Africa farthest from the sea. The parts we know best are the parts near the sea. Besides Egypt, the northern sea states, Morocco, Tunis, and Tripoli, which were called Barbary from the Barber people who live there, were the only places which people knew much about before the 16th century. We have seen how the Arabs conquered Egypt in the 7th century and then pushed their way along the North African coastlands and on into Spain. But after the Moorish power was ended in Spain, Barbary, except Morocco, was taken by the Spaniards at the beginning of the 16th century. But it never really became Spanish, and almost immediately afterwards, Algeria, Tunis, and Tripoli were taken by the Turks, who had also now conquered Egypt. Morocco alone remained independent, and some of the Moors from that state journeyed south as far as Timbuktu. The Barbary Pirates But the Turks have always seemed to stop the growth of the lands they have conquered, and the only thing that shows that these states were alive until the 19th century was the bands of pirates who sailed out in their swift low boats and attacked any ship which was not well protected with guns. The pirates were quite fearless, and even when the French and English joined against them, they could not conquer them at first. They were not always only people from Barbary. Men from European countries joined them, too, now and then. They not only attacked ships, sometimes they would swoop down on a town, kill whoever tried to resist them, and carry other people off and sell them as slaves or make their friends buy them back for immense ransoms. They often attacked Spain and Sicily and parts of Italy, but even got as far as Ireland sometimes. Of course, if the nations of Europe had really joined to conquer them, they could have done so, but they did not. Tunis was really a pirate state, and pirates ruled the chief coast towns of all these states. Twice in the 19th century, a British fleet attacked Algiers, which was one of their chief strongholds, but they were not really put down until France conquered first Algeria and then Tunis. France now really rules both of these states, though there is a native ruler in Tunisia who governs under the French. The French power has in the last few years been recognized as the chief in Morocco, though Spain is allowed to govern certain parts. For many years in the last century, several European nations wanted to be the chief power in Morocco, and Germany was the last to agree to the French ruling there. In 1912, the Italians invaded Tripoli and took it from the Turkish rulers after some fierce fighting. Egypt 
Egypt has had quite a different past from the Barbary states. When the Arabs took Egypt, it was at first ruled by governors sent by the caliphs. But in time, the governors passed on their power to their sons and became the real rulers of the country independent of the caliphs. Saladin, against whom Richard I fought in the Crusades, was one of these rulers of Egypt. Many other rulers came after Saladin, but they were often weak men, and in 1517 the Turks conquered Egypt, and they kept it till Napoleon's famous attack on Egypt in 1798. Some years before this, however, a Scotsman named James Bruce, who had had a life filled with strange adventures, had traveled through Egypt. He had spent two years at the court of the pirate rulers of Algiers, and he then traveled through Tunis to Tripoli. He took ships to the island of Crete, but was wrecked and had to swim back to the African shore. He had made up his mind to see where the Nile, the great river of Egypt, began. It was not an easy thing he had set himself to do, but he had many things in his favor. He was used to danger. He was taller and bigger than most men, very strong and very good at sports. He knew several languages well and also had a little knowledge of how to cure diseases. He arrived in Alexandria in 1768 and was able to make friends with the ruler of Egypt. The country was filled with wild men, but Bruce went among them without fear. He saw the old Egyptian city of Thebes and went across the desert to Arabia dressed as a Turkish soldier. Then he returned and went to Abyssinia, where everyone was kind to him. He stayed there two years. The king of Abyssinia did not want him to go away, but at last allowed him to, and then Bruce traveled to the place where, not the Nile, but the Blue Nile begins. He had done a great deal, but he had not done what he thought. The White Nile is really the Nile of the ancient peoples, and although he did not find its source, he traveled still further across the desert and found the place where the Blue Nile joins the White Nile, a place which British people will always remember, for there stands Khartoum, where General Gordon died. Poor Bruce, after all his hardships, found that people would not believe his story when he got back to London. Even when he wrote all his adventures down in a book, many people still refused to believe him. He went back very sad to his home in Scotland, but now we know that all he said was true. The End of Egypt's Independence Napoleon's soldiers did not stay long in Egypt. They were driven out by the English and the Turks, and then Mehemet Ali made himself ruler. He was terribly cruel, and when a British army fought against him, he cut off the heads of the soldiers and stuck them on pieces of wood in Alexandria. The strange thing is that after beginning his rule with so much cruelty, he really became a good ruler, and when he died in 1848, all the land along the Nile and the roads by which people traveled were quite safe, even for Christians. It was through the grandson of Mehemet Ali, Ismail, that Egypt lost its independence. He had been to school in France and had there learned many new ways of obtaining and spending money. Eastern people are generally extravagant, but Ismail had become worse through his life in Paris. He found that it was easy for a country to borrow money, and so he got as much as he could. He borrowed so much and so often that at last the great countries of Europe saw that they must interfere if Egypt was ever to pay its debts. But before this, Ismail had done many good things for Egypt. He got Englishmen to teach the Egyptians new ways, and letters were sent by post for the first time in the history of Egypt. He built railways, lighthouses, and telegraphs and the great canal at Suez, through which ships sail on their way to India and Australia, was opened in 1869, six years after he began to rule. In 1875, Egypt was in a very bad state. 
Ismael had no money, and no one would lend him any more. So he sold his part of the profits in the Suez Canal to Great Britain. This made England take an interest in Egyptian money matters, and when the men who were sent to find out how Ismail was spending his money told how great his debts were, an Englishman was put to sea to the collection of all the taxes, and a Frenchman to see that the money was spent wisely. After three years, Ismail tried secretly to stir up rebellions in Cairo, and then the English and French asked the Sultan of Turkey, who was supposed to be Ismail's king, to appoint another ruler for Egypt. This the Sultan did at once, and England and France helped the new ruler to govern Egypt until the Arab soldiers rose in rebellion. The British fleet then attacked Alexandria in 1882, and the English, seeing that they could not conquer the rebellious Arabs in this way alone, made up their minds to send soldiers to Egypt. France refused to send any, and so did Italy, and British soldiers had to do the work alone. England in this way came to be the only nation to help the Khedive, as the ruler of Egypt is called, to govern in peace. Sir Evelyn Baring, who is now Lord Cromer, was the Englishman sent out to represent Great Britain in 1884, and until a few years ago he remained in Egypt. He was so wise that law and order are everywhere now in Egypt, and the country is rich and prosperous. General Gordon But many Englishmen have lost their lives in making Egypt a greater and better state. The most famous of these was General Gordon. He had fought in the Crimean War and in China before he was sent to Egypt in 1874 to act as governor for the Khedive in the land to the south. He went at once to the country he was to rule and worked hard for six years putting down the slave trade, drawing maps of the unknown country, and learning to know the strange peoples of the desert. He succeeded in this so well that he could make these people do things which no one else could persuade them to do. He was always in great danger. Once a rebellion broke out at a place called Darfur, and Gordon went as fast as he could to put it down. He had only a few soldiers, and when he came near to the rebels, he left his soldiers behind and went with only one man to speak to the rebels. This man he took because he did not know the language of these people. After he had spoken to them for a little time, the rebels went quietly away. He tried to make peace in a war between Egypt and Abyssinia, but was taken prisoner. During each of the last three years of his rule, he had to ride about 3,000 miles on camels or mules, and he was quite tired out when he gave up his command in 1880. He spent a short time in South Africa, paid a visit to Palestine, and then, at the beginning of 1884, was asked by the British government to go out to Egypt once more. When Gordon left Egypt, a man whom he had once had to send away for ruling badly under him had been made governor of the Sudan, as the country south of Egypt is called. Soon his unjust rule made people very angry and an Egyptian who had been ill-treated now rose and got the people to rebel. He said that he himself was the Mahdi, the successor of Mahomed. A large army was sent to fight against him, but it was defeated, and hundreds and hundreds of soldiers were killed. Soon the Mahdi became master of nearly the whole of the Sudan except Khartoum, and Great Britain advised the Khedive to give up the Sudan altogether. Gordon was sent to see how the soldiers in the forts scattered over the Sudan could be got away to Egypt without being killed by the Mahdi. He arrived at Khartoum on the 18th of February, and all the natives welcomed him, thinking that he had come to deliver them from the Mahdi. Soon the soldiers of the Mahdi surrounded Khartoum, but not before Gordon had got the women and children safely away. There had been an army not far off at Swakin, but it was taken away, and the forts north of Khartoum were taken, so Gordon was cut off from all help. 
He had only one other white man with him. The rest were natives. There was not much food in Khartoum, and the fort was not built to stand against a strong attack. Yet the months dragged on, and still he would not surrender. There alone, in the midst of the desert, among men of a different race and religion, he held out, doing, as he said, the best for the honor of his country, waiting and hoping that help would come. On the 5th of January, 1885, the last morsel of food was eaten, and the starving men grew weaker day by day, but would not give in. But the waters of the Nile had risen and broken one of the walls, and when the Mahdi and his followers rushed in on 26th January, the men were too weak to resist. Gordon and many others were killed. I am quite happy, thank God, he had written in a letter which he left behind for his sister. I have tried to do my duty. Two days after his death, the help he had hoped for arrived, but it was too late, and many long years were to pass before the Egyptian army, trained and drilled by British officers and helped by British soldiers, was to avenge the death of Gordon. Little by little, this army was built up. Step by step, it marched forward into the Sudan until Sir Herbert, now Lord Kitchener, felt that it was strong enough to attack the Mahdi's stronghold at Omdurman, two miles north of Khartoum. The followers of the Mahdi fought so bravely that 10,000 were killed before they gave in, but at last the black flag, which used to fly at Omdurman, was captured and sent home to Queen Victoria. The Mahdi's power was destroyed forever. This was in 1898. On Sunday, 4th September, two days after the victory, General Kitchener, with a man from each regiment, crossed the Nile to Khartoum, hoisted the flags of Great Britain and Egypt, and held a service in memory of General Gordon on the spot where he died. Since then, Egypt has grown still more prosperous under the direction of Great Britain. A university was founded at Khartoum a few years ago, and the place which was the scene of so terrible a tragedy is now a peaceful and prosperous town. Lord Cromer resigned his position as representative of Great Britain in 1907, and now Lord Kitchener who did so much to give Egypt peace and safety, has taken his place. The Explorers So far, only a fringe of Africa has been mentioned. The story of the rest of this huge continent is chiefly the story of the brave men who spent their lives in trying to learn something of its mystery. It is strange to think that the explorers who have discovered what is known about Africa nearly all, and certainly all the greatest, lived within the last hundred years. It is true that in the 15th century, the brave Portuguese sailor Bartholomew Diaz sailed round the Cape of Good Hope and stopped at many places on the coast, and Portuguese missionaries made their way into Abyssinia. And it is also true that the Dutch, two centuries later, settled in Cape Town, but behind these coastlands lay the dark continent about which the people of Europe knew nothing until the 19th century. Mungo Park One of the first explorers to go to Africa was a young Scottish doctor named Mungo Park. It was only a year after the death of Bruce, who discovered the source of the Blue Nile, that Mungo Park started out to follow the course of the Niger, a river of West Africa. He reached the Gambia River, and having anchored his ship as far up as he could sail, he set out on horseback with a Negro servant and a slave boy. The natives warned him not to travel into the desert, but he went on. He had to make friends with the native chiefs whom he met. Once he had to give up his best coat because a chief liked the yellow buttons so much. He traveled through part of the country where war was going on, and the Negro servant ran away. Mungo Park was taken prisoner and badly treated, but at last got away. But he had no food or drink. When he thought he must surely die, he came at last to the long-sought majestic Niger glittering in the morning sun. He traveled still further, but he was nearly dead from hunger, 
and from the suffering caused by the bites of mosquitoes, and so he sadly turned back. He had followed the great river three hundred miles, and after a few years in England he went out again. Once more he had to go through terrible sufferings. He started with a good many men this time, but many died, and with only seven left he went on, determined to discover the termination of the Niger, or perish, in the attempt. His end was very sad. The little party was sailing down a river when they saw the whole bank covered with natives who shot arrows and threw spears at them, and all but one man, seeing no way of escape, jumped overboard and were drowned. David Livingston. It was thirty-six years before the next great explorer went to Africa. This was David Livingston, who was also a Scotsman like Mungo Park. He had had a hard time as a boy. He left school when he was only ten years old and worked for many years in a cotton mill before he was able to go to college to study to become a missionary. He wished to go to China, but when he had studied for a long time and had become a doctor, he was sent out to Africa. This was in 1841. He was 28 years old then and a strange man to look at. He looked rough, but he was really very gentle, and he was always bubbling over with fun. He traveled great distances on his first journey, his winning manner helping him to make friends with the natives and he soon made up his mind that he could do most good by traveling as far as possible and handing over the knowledge he had won for others to follow. He had not been in Africa very long before he was attacked by a lion, which crushed his arm so that it never really got well. He got married in Africa and still continued his journeys. Sometimes he stayed a little time in one place, and once after he had done this, the whole tribe of people followed him when he went away, because they loved him so much. In 1849, he crossed the great Kalahari Desert and reached Lake Ngami, which he was the first white man to see. This was only one of the many discoveries he made. He reached the Zambezi River in 1851, and, later on, he made up his mind to follow it, see where it began, and where it entered the sea. It is impossible to tell of all his journeyings, how he crossed Africa to the Portuguese town Luanda on the west, and then followed the Zambezi right to the east coast. When he reached Luanda, he was nearly dead. He had suffered terribly from fever, and for many days had had hardly anything to eat. After a short rest, he set off again, always writing down carefully what he had found out, and again he was nearly dead when he reached another Portuguese town on the west. But he left his men there, and two months later had the joy of reaching the place where the Zambezi runs into the sea. After a year in England, he went to Africa again in 1858 and he was very angry when he saw the terrible cruelties of the slave trade. The Arabs who bought and sold the Negroes as slaves treated them worse than beasts. Livingston made up his mind to do all he could to put an end to the slave trade in Africa. Wherever he went, he set the slaves free, but once he had to stand by while Arab traders killed hundreds of women. He had lost the four goats he had taken with him, his medicine chest was stolen, and he could do nothing to help himself. He was not heard of for a long time, and people thought that he must be dead. So a brave man called Henry Morton Stanley was sent out by the owner of a great newspaper to try and find him. When Livingston, worn out, thin from fever and half-starved, reached Ujiji on Lake Tanganyika, what was his joy to find Stanley waiting for him with food and medicine? He seemed to get new life from the meeting and started afresh to find new places. Stanley had to leave him in 1872, and Livingston was never seen again by white men. He traveled from Tanganyika to Benguiolo, but their fever and the terrible disease of dysentery came on again. He grew worse and worse so that the natives had to carry him. On 27th April, he wrote for the last time in his diary, 
On 30th April, he could just wind his watch, and the next day the natives found him kneeling by the side of his bed, dead. They carried the body and all the dead man's books to the coast, where they could give them into the keeping of white men, for they were anxious to do all they could to show their love and respect for their dead teacher. The body was brought to England and buried in Westminster Abbey. Stanley went out to Africa the next year and discovered the Edward Nyanza. Nyanza is the African name for lake. He went right across the center of the continent. It was the travels of these brave men that made the people of Europe begin to wish to take the land of Africa for themselves. At the beginning of the 19th century, Great Britain got Cape Colony by the Peace of Paris. It was a strange people the British had to rule there. The Dutch settlers of the 17th century had married with French Huguenots who came later, and these independent and rather hard men were jealous of the English settlers who now flocked to South Africa. They hated the English for putting an end to slavery and the slave trade, and in 1835 a great number of them moved together, or trekked, as they say in Africa, northwards to Natal, where they founded a republic. But not many years later, Dental was made a British colony, and many pieces of land where the natives were rebellious were added to Cape Colony. Others of the Dutch, or Boers, as they were called, when they settled in Africa, founded the Orange Free State, east of Natal. Great Britain took that in 1848, but gave it back to the Boers to rule six years later. Other Boers settled north of the Orange Free State and founded the Transvaal Republic, but they fought so much with the natives that Great Britain took it from them in 1877. This did not help the English very much, for they had now to struggle with the natives. The warlike Zulus, a very savage tribe, rose under their king Quechueo, and after defeating the English in one terrible battle, they were beaten in 1880, and Zululand was added to Natal. This was a chance for the Transvaal. They had been afraid of the Zulus before, but now that they were beaten, the Boers rebelled against the English. They soon beat the few British soldiers in South Africa. They had been fighting for years against the natives and knew better than the English how to fight in that country. The British government, while new soldiers were still on the way to South Africa, gave back to the Transvaal the right to govern itself. This looked to the Boers as if Great Britain had been really beaten, and they did not take much notice of the conditions on which Great Britain had given them back their independence. It was only a few years later, in 1884, that Germany seized a big piece of Africa, both on the west and east coasts. Gold mines were now discovered in the Transvaal, and gold seekers soon poured in from England. Johannesburg, the town in the center of the district, grew by leaps and bounds. The Boers had always been clever to take advantage of any chance, so they put large taxes on the newcomers but would not allow them any share in governing the country. But the outlanders, as the Dutch called the newcomers, came by and by to feel very angry against this unjust treatment. The ideal of Cecil Rhodes. There was at this time in South Africa a young man named Cecil Rhodes who saw all the difficulties. He had gone out to South Africa when he was only 17 because of his delicate health. He soon got sufficient money from gold digging to be able to do what he liked, and his one thought was that all the strange and splendid country he had seen should be for Great Britain. His health grew better, and he went to Oxford to complete his education, but it broke down again, and he was told he had only six months to live. He went back to South Africa and entered the Cape Colony Parliament, and when he was after a time strong enough to go back to Oxford to take his degree, he was already a statesman. He was becoming richer all this time from the Kimberley Diamond Fields. He saw the danger of the Transvaal blocking the way to the north and the equal danger that the German colonies on the east and west coasts should meet. 
and he persuaded the British government to take the huge tract of land called Bechuanaland under its protection. In 1889, he founded a South African company which had great powers over the land now called Rhodesia after Rhodes himself. Rhodesia stretched up to the German colony on the east coast and the Congo Free State. Bechuanaland and Rhodesia kept the way to the north quite open for Great Britain, and Englishmen began to dream of a great belt of land which should unite Egypt with Cape Colony and be all for Great Britain. Rhodes became Prime Minister, or Chief Man, in the government of Cape Colony in 1890. The Outlanders were now thoroughly angry about their grievances, and one of them, Dr. Jameson, collected a band of men and tried to get their rights by fighting for them. The Boers easily beat them, and then, after such a short battle, began to think even more badly about the British. The Boers all over South Africa were roused, and at last Sir Alfred Milner was sent to try and make peace between them and the English settlers. President Kruger was then head of the Transvaal, and he flatly refused to make the condition of the Outlanders any better. The Boer War No one in Great Britain was expecting trouble when suddenly the Boers demanded things which could not be granted, and in 1899 war broke out between Great Britain and the Transvaal. The Boers were good fighters. They could shoot straight and ride for days without being tired out. There were very few British soldiers in South Africa, and soon they had to retreat to Ladysmith in Natal. Fresh soldiers were at once sent out from England under Sir Redvers Buller. Some of them were sent to Kimberley in the Diamond Fields, and some to help the soldiers in Ladysmith. Others tried to stop the Boers who were invading Cape Colony, but disasters came everywhere. The British soldiers, brave as they were, did not know the country, and were easily beaten by the Boers. More soldiers were sent out in 1900, and the great general, Lord Roberts, was sent to lead them with Lord Kitchener, who had avenged Gordon in Egypt as his chief assistant. Soldiers came also from Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Things began to look brighter for the British when, in February, Lord Roberts surrounded the Boer General Cronje at Kudusburg and made him give in. There were 4,000 Boers taken prisoners in this battle on 29th February, and, the day before, Lady Smith had been relieved by Sir Redvers Buller. The British army now in the Orange Free State, for all the Boer states were helping the Transvaal, found no resistance, but fever had broken out and many soldiers died. A free state was now taken, and Lord Roberts marched into the Transvaal. The march was made quickly, and sometimes the Boers won in small battles, but in June the last real Boer army was beaten, and President Kruger had fled. The Transvaal was taken, Kruger sailed to Europe, and it was thought the war was over. But for two years, the struggle still went on. The Boers split up their army into small bands and attacked whenever and wherever they could. Lord Roberts had gone back to England, and Lord Kitchener built small forts all over the country. There were many small battles, and sometimes still the Boers won. Then at length, in March 1902, the Boers saw they could hold out no longer and went to Pretoria to ask for peace. The agreement was signed on the 21st of May, and the war was at last at an end. Since 1902, the peoples of South Africa have been allowed to govern themselves, and Cape Colony, Natal, the Transvaal, and the Orange Free State have joined together, just as the first colonies in Canada did. There are still some things on which the Boers and the English do not agree, but they are learning to live together in peace and the Union of South Africa, which is the name of the four colonies, is growing more and more prosperous. A railway from Cairo in Egypt is getting longer every day, and will soon meet one from Cape Colony. When the two join, the heart of the Dark Continent will be robbed of some of its mystery.
The settlements of other European nations are also growing, as well as the British colonies north of South Africa, and the natives are learning to trust their white rulers and imitate their ways. End of chapter 46 Chapter 47 of The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sylvie Wolf. The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls By Elizabeth O'Neill Chapter 47 The Story of China and Japan it was not until the 19th century that the countries of Europe had any real connection with the two great countries of Asia, China and Japan. Yet, the Chinese had a civilization older than any in Europe. Their country is larger than all the countries of Europe put together, and more than 400 millions of people live in it. The Chinese are a Mongolian people like the Turks. They have yellow skins and straight black hair, which, until lately, hung in long plates down their backs from the center of their heads, the rest of the head being shaven. The children's heads are shaven too, and until their hair has grown long enough to be put into a pigtail, it stands up in little tufts from the middle of their heads. But now most of the Chinese have had their pigtails cut off to show their liking for the new freedom which is finding its way into their land. We may often see Chinamen in the streets of our big towns today, but before the 19th century, this never happened, for the Chinese had got to a certain state of civilization, and for hundreds of years they had gone no further. They wanted to have nothing to do with foreigners and to live their own life in their own way. Yet hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, the Chinese knew how to write. Before that time, too, they could build suspension bridges and had made the wonderful Great Wall, 1,500 miles long, with towers and fortifications. The wall was really a road on top, and along it the caravans traveled which traded between Siberia and China. They had silk manufactures and made beautiful China, and they had discovered the art of printing 500 years before it was discovered in Europe. But China had never gone much further, and Europe knew little about her except the stories which Marco Polo told after his famous journey to the court of the Great Khan, and these people had not believed. Picture Caption A Chinese Emperor of the 9th Century Examining the Governors of Cities From an Ancient Chinese Painting End Caption in the 16th century, traders from Portugal stopped at places on the Chinese coast, and later the English followed. In the 17th century, tea was brought from China to Europe. No one had ever seen it before. But the Chinese would not let people go far into their country. When, in the 16th century, a curious Portuguese succeeded in getting to Peking, the capital of China, he had his head cut off. And still, in the 19th century, it was the same. The Chinese took no notice of all the wonderful things which were happening in Europe, but went quietly on in their own way. Japan, too. When people began to be interested in it, in the 19th century, was just as anxious to keep itself free from the foreigners. But the Japanese soon showed that they were a very different people from the Chinese. Their history does not go so far back. They are probably a people of mixed race, but they must have some Chinese blood in their veins and are rather like the Chinese to look at. Picture Caption A Great Battle in Japanese History Painted by a Japanese artist From a great painting 12 feet long of the Battle of Ogaki by a famous Japanese artist this was one of the greatest battles in Japanese history. It was fought in the 17th century and gave the shogun, a kind of hereditary prime minister, the supreme power in Japan, even over the Mikado, which he held until the awakening of Japan to Western ideas in the 19th century. End caption. 
Some people think that there is a large Aryan element in their blood. We know that the Japanese had taken possession of their beautiful highlands at least in the first century after the birth of Christ. Their history was not unlike that of the peoples of Europe in the early Middle Ages. There was an emperor called the Mikado over all the land, but a kind of feudalism grew up in which great lords got all power. The Portuguese traders went to Japan also in the 16th century, and the Jesuits sent their missionaries to teach the people Christianity. But not much progress was made. Japan, like China, did not like foreigners. But in 1853, the United States sent some warships under Commodore Perry with a letter from the president to the Mikado, asking him to make friends with the United States. He pointed out to them how near the two countries really were. The Japanese did not like the idea. But when a few months later the Americans came for their answer, the Japanese said yes, for they knew that they had no fleet to fight against the nations of Europe and America if they chose to fight them. Soon, America, Great Britain, Russia and Holland all had permission to trade at certain ports with Japan. In 1862, some Japanese were sent to journey through Europe and America. Everything was new and wonderful to them. Their own land was very charming, full of flowers, it was from Japan that chrysanthemums were first brought to Europe. The people themselves were small but quaint and pretty and wore graceful clothes of cotton or silk with great white sashes. Theirs is the land of sunshine though the top of the great mountain Fujiyama is covered with snow. They were fine artists and everything in Japan then, as now, seemed pretty and clean. But in the middle of the 19th century, the Japanese knew nothing of modern inventions. And these first men from Japan who came to Europe were full of enthusiasm when they went back. But there were many men in Japan who still hated the idea of imitating Western ways. These men joined together and overthrew the power of the great lords. The emperor got all power again and they hoped he would send the foreigners away, but he did not. The old Mikado died and the new one was full of enthusiasm too for the things which were to be learned from the West. Soon Japan had a navy and an army imitated from those of the countries of Europe. A new system of education was set up and every child in Japan was sent to school. Tokyo, the capital of Japan, became the largest city in Asia and one of the greatest in the world. It has electric light, telephones and telegraphs, all learned from the West. By degrees, too, Japan has won a parliament through which the people can use their power. Thought the Mikado is still more powerful and important in some ways than most constitutional kings. The Japanese people have great respect and reverence for those above them and for old people generally. They are very honorable too and very brave. In some ways, they are the most wonderful people of our modern world for the quick, eager way they have learned so many new things in so short a time. Japan, a small nation, after all about as big as Great Britain, first proved her new found strength in the struggle with China. All this time, China remained as obstinate as ever, hating all new things. In 1840, she had been obliged to open up some of her ports to British trade and had given up the city of Hong Kong to Great Britain. But this was only after a war between the English and Chinese called the Opium War. British traders carried opium, which they got from the poppy fields of North India, into China. Now opium is a drug which makes people sleepy and stupid when they eat it and ruins the health of people who get into the habit of using it. It makes people intoxicated in the worst way even than too much wine or beer. Some of the Chinese people grew very fond of opium and the emperor tried to prevent the British from bringing it into China. A short war took place and then the Chinese had to give in. 
A few years later, there was another war, in which France and England, together, destroyed some of the Chinese forts and marched to Peking. The Chinese emperor had put some English in prison. These were released, but to give the Chinese a lesson, the wonderful summer palace of the emperor at Peking was destroyed by the soldiers. More ports were then opened. Soon afterwards, the English helped the Chinese soldiers to put down a rebellion of thousands of Chinese who had risen against the government, following their leader, who was a madman who thought he was a prophet and ought to rule over China. This time, English and Chinese soldiers marched together against the rebels, and peace was made. At last, the United States and the great European countries were allowed to send ambassadors to live in Peking, as they do to all the capitals of other countries. The Chino-Japanese War broke out in 1894. It was about the peninsula of Korea, which lies between the two countries. It did not belong to either, but the Japanese heard that the Chinese were making ready to invade it. The Japanese sent word to China that this must not be, but the Chinese went on with their preparations. Then war came. Everybody thought that little Japan would be crushed by the great power of China, but the Japanese won on land and sea. The Japanese fleet won a great victory over the Chinese in Korea Bay. And then the Chinese ships sailed off to Port Arthur in Manchuria. But the Japanese landed and took the town which is now one terminus of the Trans-Siberian Railway. Then China begged for peace. The Japanese were admired by all Europe. Her young soldiers had fought like heroes. A story is told of one boy who was blowing the bugle as he stood by his captain. A bullet struck him in the chest. But still, he blew till he dropped dead. But the Japanese had never really feared China. They knew that Russia wanted to take China for herself. And indeed, no sooner was the Treaty of Peace signed between China and Japan than Russia got France and Germany to join her in taking all that Japan had won. The Japanese waited their time. Meanwhile, in the year 19, many Chinese angry at the way in which the European countries had interfered in China, rose to attack the houses in Peking where the European ambassadors lived. The German ambassador was murdered in the street. Many missionaries who were trying to convert China to Christianity were murdered in the same way or burned in their houses with their wives and children. Many of the ambassadors were besieged in Peking but were saved when the armies of six countries, with Japan amongst them, marched to their help. So far, the relations between China and Europe have not been a success. Yet, the Chinese are a splendid people in many ways, full of energy and industry. When they become Christians, they are splendid men indeed. And just lately, men in China have risen to demand freedom too, like the peoples of the West. A new constitution has been planned. We do not yet know how it will work, but the Chinese sent a touching request for prayers to be said in England for their success in their new way of life. On Sunday, 27th April 1913, prayers were said in most of the churches throughout Great Britain for, in the words of the Chinese message, the newly established government for the president yet to be elected, for the constitution of the republic, that the government may be recognized by the powers, that peace may reign within our country, that strong, virtuous man may be elected to office, that the government may be established on a strong foundation. With Japan, as we have seen, things are quite different. In the year 1904, the Japanese felt themselves strong enough to demand their rights from Russia, and the Russo-Japanese War began. Before this, everyone had feared Russia. People had believed that she had a wonderful army, but neither her army nor her navy was a match for those of Japan. At the beginning of the war, the Japanese defeated the Russian fleet and landed their armies in Korea. Terrible battles followed. 
in any one of which the Russians lost more soldiers than were killed altogether in the Boer War. When peace was made, Korea was given to Japan. Before this, Japan and England had made the Treaty of Friendship. Both were determined to prevent the power of Russia from growing. England feared that Russia might attack her empire in India, and both were determined that China should be left with the Chinese. For this and other reasons, the friendship between England and Japan is very close. Both are island nations and have very much in common. End of chapter 47 Chapter 48 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 48 Our World Today. Our world today is very different from the world of even a hundred years ago. Children, who have not had time to see many changes, can hardly understand how different it is. A hundred years ago, steam engines were only just being thought of. Before that, things had to be carried along rough roads and wagons from place to place. People who were rich enough traveled on horseback or in carriages, and for ordinary travelers in the eighteenth century, There were stagecoaches which traveled between the biggest towns very slowly and painfully, for all over England and other countries, too, the roads were very bad. Now, when we want to go to another town, we step into a railway train which carries us there at the rate of from thirty to sixty miles an hour. Even when the roads had begun to be made better, and the ruts four foot deep, got rid of toward the end of the eighteenth century, it took three whole days for a letter to be carried from Bath to London. Now we can post a letter in any town in England or Scotland and know that it will reach London by the next morning. In those days, families did not break up and scatter all over the world. When they did, it was very difficult for them to get news of each other. Even after Queen Victoria began to reign in England, People had generally to pay at least a shilling for a letter to be sent to another part of England. But then it was arranged that letters could be sent to any part of the British Isles for a penny. And now a penny stamp will carry a letter to our friends in any of the British colonies, so that, though people are separated by such enormous distances, they feel in some ways nearer to each other than people in different parts of England did a hundred years ago. The first real passenger train began to run in England in 1830. It went at the rate of twenty miles an hour, which seemed very terrible and dangerous to people then, and, sad to say, one man was killed on the opening day of this railway between Liverpool and Manchester. Now our express trains go at the rate of sixty miles an hour. By this time, It was found that steam could be used to drive ships instead of waiting for wind to fill their sails. It was thought very wonderful when a steamer called the Great Western crossed the Atlantic from Bristol to New York in fifteen days. Now it is regularly done in a week. More wonderful than the discovery of steam was that of electricity. Through it, people can send messages by telegram so that news can be had in a few minutes from places miles away, and through its use on the telephone, people can speak to each other from place to place, even from cities so far apart as Paris and London. Cables, enclosing telegraph wires, have been laid down on the ocean floor from England to America, and cablegrams can be sent so that in a few hours people in any part of America can have news from friends in Europe. Submarine cables are now laid between many places all over the world. But in the last few years, an inventor called Marconi has discovered that messages can be sent by electricity between two instruments without any wires at all. 
This would have seemed like magic to people a hundred years ago. It is a very wonderful and important discovery. Already it has been very useful. Ships in distress which have wireless instruments can ask for help from other ships miles away. It was through the wireless messages by Phillips, the heroic telegraphist on the great steamer the Titanic, which was wrecked in 1912, that help came from the Carpathia, and the people who had been got into the lifeboats before the steamer sank were saved. Almost like magic, too, it seems that photographs can also be sent by electricity, so that photographs of a football match or any interesting event can be sent from the place it has happened in, such as Leeds or Manchester, and the pictures will be published in the London evening papers an hour or two later. The daily newspaper, again, is a thing that was quite new to our great-grandfathers. There were daily papers in London at the end of the 18th century, but they were few and expensive. After the middle of the 19th century, they became common in other large towns, and now very few people feel quite happy without their morning and evening paper, in which they may read the things that have happened all over the world the day before, things the news of which would have taken weeks and months and even years to come to us before the days of telegrams. Electricity is used, of course, for light and heat, and new houses nearly everywhere have electric light, while even gaslight was not known a hundred years ago when people used candles or oil lamps. In the last few years, too, it has been discovered that man can travel through the air quicker and more smoothly than by the quickest express trains. The great invention of the airship has come to us within the last few years. Every few weeks some improvement is made, and airmen are learning to manage their ships more easily. But as yet, things are only at the beginning, and already many brave airmen have lost their lives, as brave pioneers must often do. People talk of the days when nations will no longer fight at sea with the great ironclad warships, which also were first built in the 19th century, but will fight their battles in the air with fleets of airships. Balloons were invented at the end of the 18th century. In them also, men can go through the air. But at first they could only go like sailing ships in the direction in which they were sent by the wind. Now, however, in the last few years, airmen have discovered how to make balloons go in any direction they wish. And the dirigible balloons are thought to be more useful by many people than even airships. Several airmen have now crossed the English Channel and prizes are being offered for the first flight right round England and Scotland, and the first flight across the Atlantic. So we live in a world of change and adventure. Brave and clever people are doing wonderful things every day to try to make the world a more comfortable place. But even more wonderful than these changes in the things around us, changes most of which have begun in England and have spread all over the world, are the changes which have come over the minds of men. In most countries, now men may believe as they like, and religion is a matter for each person to settle for himself. This spirit of toleration and freedom is the thing which we ought to value most of all the things which make our world today different from the world of a hundred years ago. At the beginning of the nineteenth century, the laws against Catholics, which prevented them from taking part in the government of their countries, were withdrawn in England and Ireland. For hundreds of years the Catholics in England and Ireland had been looked upon almost as criminals, and very hard laws had been passed against them. This was especially terrible in Ireland, where nearly all the people were Catholic. Up to this time the Irish had had their own parliament, but only Protestants could sit in it or even vote for the people who became members of parliament. But now this has changed, and at last the Catholic Irish were given the ordinary rights of citizens. The Irish Parliament was, however, given up, and Ireland, for the future, sent members to the English Parliament, as Scotland had already done for a hundred years. Many of the Irish have never been pleased with this arrangement, and Ireland may soon have home rule again. But Catholic emancipation was only one sign of a new spirit which was passing over the world. The new democratic spirit is seen, too, in the education of children. 
in nearly all countries now children are sent to schools which the governments keep up so that even the poorest people can give their children a good education a hundred years ago very many of the people could not read or write at all and especially miserable were the children of poor people in england at the end of the eighteenth century and the beginning of the nineteenth in the second half of the eighteenth century manufactures had grown very quickly in england things which had before been made by people in their homes in the country were now made much more quickly in great factories built in the towns this was through the invention of new machines it was now found that even children could help to work these machines and little children of six and seven years old were crowded into the factories working from early morning till dark but soon this was changed laws were passed which said that children should no longer work in the factories until they were older and then only for a few hours now no boy or girl is allowed to leave school until fourteen years of age and so every child has a chance of learning things that will help it to live a wise and happy life the children of the british empire whether in great britain or the colonies have also the joy of feeling that they belong to a great race that all over the world people speaking their language and loving their country are living their lives in their own way they can like and admire the people of other nations but they cannot help loving the people of their own empire it is this feeling of loyalty to the nation and the empire that led to the setting up of boy scouts in england a great movement which is now spread to other countries for while we wish that peace may be kept between the nations we naturally feel determined to be ready to defend our empire if that peace is broken in reading history children nearly always feel glad that they were born in their own time and not in the past when there was so much cruelty and bloodshed for unfortunately in many parts of the story of the world it is tales of cruelty and intolerance which have to be told but then too there are the tales of the heroes and saints and martyrs the pioneers and discoverers and all who have done their part to make our world today a better place this is one of the great lessons of history that we too should do our part honorably and well and in reading the story of the world think not only of the romance of the past and present but of the romance of the future Two. End of section forty eight. End of the story of the world, a simple history for boys and girls, by Elizabeth O'Neill.